Okay. We supposed to start, Mike, or I may begin. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Mike gave me some orders yesterday. Uh, he told me that uh, instead of just throwing the thing open to discussion the way I've done in past years, he wanted me to make a little speech first. I don't know why. I have to ask him. But if the speech is too boring, uh, stop me and we can go off the other way. Uh, the speech is supposed to have be about the fact that this is a media institute, and therefore you're concerned primarily with the media, so I'm supposed to talk about the media, which actually I write about and so on, but that's a little bit misleading. P part of the reason, at least for me, why I, why I write about the media is because I'm really interested in the whole general kind of intellectual culture. And the part of it that's, that's easiest to study is the media. So, you know, it comes out every day, you've got a ton of things, you can do a systematic investigation, you can compare yesterday's version with today's version, you have a lot of evidence about what's played up and what isn't played up and the way things are structured and so on. Uh, my frank impression is that the media aren't very different from scholarship <coughs> or from, uh, say, journals of, you know, journals of intellectual opinion and stuff like that, but uh, more, uh, you know, there are some uh, extra constraints, but uh, it's not radically different. They interact and they're not that far apart, which is why people go up and back quite easily be among them. Uh, when you talk about, so I'll talk about the media, but that's mainly for these reasons. Uh, the, uh, you look at the media, they, uh, uh, the f you take a look at any institution, you want to understand it. Uh, you first of all ask questions about its internal institutional structure, like how, they or how are they structured and organized. You want to know something about their setting in the broader society, so what's their institutional setting, how do they relate to other systems of uh, power and authority and so on. And uh, if you're lucky, there's an internal record which tells you from leading people in the information system, uh, which tells you what they're up to, and you want to pay attention to that, so sort of a doctrinal system. That doesn't mean the PR handouts, but what they say you know, to each other, let's say, about what they're up to. And there's quite a lot of that, and that's interesting. So those are three major sources of uh, information about the nature of the media. You want to study them the way, you know, say a scientist would study some complex molecule or something. You take a look at the structure, and then you make some hypotheses based on the structure as to what the media product is likely to look like, uh, and then you investigate, see what the media product is, and how well it conforms to these hypotheses, and if it diverges where, and so on and so forth. And virtually all the work in media analysis is this last part, uh, trying to study carefully just what the media product is and whether indeed it conforms to the obvious assumptions about the nature and the structure of the media. Uh, and there are various ways to approach that question. They've been discussed and we could talk about that. So that's the field of media analysis. Uh, well, what do you find, roughly? I mean, a, like one minute sketch. Because it's pretty obvious, so I don't have to waste any time on it. Uh, first of all, if you look at the media, you find that they're, they're differentiated. So there's different media which do different things, like the entertainment and you know, the Hollywood and soap operas and so on, or even most of the newspapers in the country, like the overwhelming majority of them. They are aimed at a mass audience. Uh, there's another sector of the media, the kind of elite media, sometimes called the agenda-setting media because they set the they're the ones with the big resources, and they set the framework within which everybody else operates and so on. So that's like the New York Times, you know, and CBS and that kind of thing. Uh, they, uh, they have a different audience. They, their audience is mostly uh, r quite privileged people. So the people who uh, read the New York Times, let's say, small sector of the population, uh, people are wealthy, uh, part of sometimes what's called the political class. You know, they're actually involved in the political system in an ongoing fashion. They're basically managers of one sort or another. They can be political managers, uh, business managers like corporate executives or, you know, that sort of thing, or doctoral managers like university professors or uh, jur other journalists and so on who are involved in kind of organizing the way people think and look at things. 
so that's basically the audience of the uh, uh, of the elite media. The elite media do set a framework within which others operate. So, like if you're watching the Associated Press, you know, it grinds out the news in a constant flow. If you're watching it at around you know mid-afternoon, it breaks, and there's something comes along every day which says notice to editors. Uh, tomorrow's New York Times is going to have the following stories on the front page. Okay, and the point of that is that if you're like an editor of a newspaper in Dayton, Ohio or something, and you don't have the resources to figure out what the news is and you don't want to think about it anyway, uh, this tells you what the news is. Okay, so these are the stories. Like for the quarter page that you're going to devote to something other than diverting your audience, uh, these are the stories that you put there because that's what the New York Times tells us is what you're supposed to think for tomorrow, you know. Uh, and that's, it's not, you know, if, like if you were an editor in Dayton, Ohio, you would sort of have to do that because you don't have much else in the way of resources. And if you get out of line, like if you're producing stories that the big press doesn't like, you'll hear about it pretty soon. In fact, what just happened at San Jose Mercury News is a dramatic example of this. So there are a lot of ways in which power plays can drive you right back into line if you move out. Uh, and if you try to break the mold, you're not going to last long. Uh, so that framework does, in fact, work pretty well. And it's understandable. I mean, it's just a reflection of obvious power structure. Well, let's, for, for the mass media, you know, the real mass media, those that are directed to a mass audience, uh, I mean, you know perfectly well what they're up to. They're basically trying to divert people, to get them out of our hair. You know, let them do something else, but don't bother us, us being the people who run the show. So let them get interested. Professional sports is an example. Let them everybody be crazed about professional sports or sex scandals or you know, um, you know, the personalities and their problems or something like that. Anything as long as it's not serious. Uh, of course, the serious stuff is for the big guys. Uh, we take care of that. So that's the real mass media. Actually, they're not much studied, which is a shame because there's, it's an interesting, to it's a hard topic to study all that kind of stuff. You know, a lot of things you got to look at, but uh, it takes resources. But especially if you're thinking about television and the movies and so on. But uh, anyway, what they're up to is pretty obvious, and you know, anybody knows it who lives in this society because you're exposed to it all the time. Uh, what, so let me talk just about the elite media, the agenda-setting ones. What are they? So like the New York Times and CBS, for example. Well, first of all, they are major corporations, very profitable, huge corporations. Uh, furthermore, most of them are either interlinked or outright owned by much bigger corporations like General Electric and Westinghouse and so on. So they're way up at the top of the power structure of the private economy. Uh, which is a very tyrannical structure. I mean, corporations are basically tyrannies, you know, hierarchic uh, control from above. I mean, you don't like what they're doing, you get out and that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, and the major media are just part of that system. Uh, what about their institutional setting? Well, that's more or less the same. I mean, they, what they interact with and relate to is other major power centers. So the the government, uh, other corporate corporations, uh, the universities, because they are a doctrinal system, so they interact closely with the universities. Uh, like if you're a reporter and you're writing a story on, uh, you know, central, you know, I don't know, Southeast Asia or Africa or something like that, uh, you're supposed to go over to the big university and find an expert and they'll tell you what to write, and or else go to one of the foundations, you know, like. Brookings Institute or American Enterprise Institute, and they'll tell you what, they'll give you the words to say and so on. These outside institutions are very similar to the media. I mean, the universities, for example, are not independent institutions. I mean, like there may be independent people scattered around in them, but that's true of the media, it's true of the corporations, it's true of fascist states for that matter. Uh, but the institution itself is parasitic. It's dependent on outside sources of support and those sources of support are not, uh, you know, like Z Magazine or 95% of the population in the country. Uh, they're private wealth, big corporations with grants, uh, the government, which is itself so closely interlinked with corporate power that you can barely distinguish them. Uh, uh, that's essentially what the university is in the middle of. Uh, and people within them who don't uh, 
you know, sort of uh, adjust to that structure and accept it and usually internalize it because you can't really work with it unless you internalize it and believe it. People who don't do that are likely to be weeded out along the way, actually starting from kindergarten, you know, all the way up. There's all sorts of filtering devices that get rid of people who are pain in the neck and think independently and so on and so forth. And you end up with a, th there's a lot of, uh, I mean, you've all been through college and you know that the whole educational system is very highly uh, geared to uh, um, a, a rewarding conformity and obedience. I mean, if you don't do that, you're a troublemaker and so on. So it's kind of filtering device, which ends up with people who really honestly, they're not lying, you know, they honestly internalize the framework of belief and attitudes of the surrounding of the power system in the society. The real elite institutions like, say, uh, you know, Harvard and Princeton and the upscale small colleges, for example, I mean, they're very much geared to socialization. I don't know if you happen to have been in them, but if you go through, say, a place like Harvard, uh, most of what goes on there is teaching you manners. Uh, you know, so like how to behave like a member of the upper classes and how to think the right thoughts and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, that was pointed out by George Orwell in a, uh, an essay that had an interesting history. Uh, you, everybody knows Animal Farm, okay, came out around mid-40s. And it was a satire on the, so it was a, on the Soviet Union, you know, totalitarian state. It's a big hit. Everybody loved it. Uh, turns out that he wrote an introduction to Animal Farm, which was suppressed. Uh, it came out, it only appeared 30 years later. Somebody found it in his papers. Uh, the introduction to Animal Farm, he, he was writing in England. The introduction to Animal Farm was called Literary Censorship in England. And uh, what it says is that uh, obviously this book is, uh, you know, is, uh, carries. It's ridiculing uh, the Soviet Union and its totalitarian structure. But he said England's not all that different. I mean, we're a free society. We don't have the KGB on our neck. But the end result comes out pretty much the same. He says people who have uh, uh, independent ideas or who think the wrong kind of thoughts are cut out of the, you know, they're, they're removed from ex reaching the public in one or another fashion. And then he gives some examples and so on. Then he talks a little bit. He has only a few sentences of analysis as to why it happens. I mean, the, what, we're talk, what I'm talking about now, the institutional structure, actually has two sentences. He says, why does this happen? He says, well, one, uh, because the press is owned by wealthy men uh, who only want certain things to reach the public, which is you know, a very brief way of saying what I was saying in a complicated way. Uh, and uh, the other thing he said is that uh, when you go through uh, the elite education system, like you go through the proper schools and you end up in Oxford and you know, so on, the path to entering into the top of the society, you go through this, you just learn that there are certain things that it's not proper to say, and in fact there are certain thoughts that it's not proper to have. Uh, well, that's the socialization role of the elite institutions, and if you don't adapt to that, you're usually out. Uh, I mean, the, like there's statistical error in the system, so you get sort of people filtering through for one or another reason. But it's, uh, he's basically correct. I mean, those two sentences more or less tell the story. Uh, the press is owned by wealthy men, uh, meaning, you know, big corporations and tied to other powers and so on, and they have a certain picture of the world they want to see uh, expressed, and it is expressed. Uh, and the other thing is that the people who enter it, who make it through the system and are in positions where they can do anything about it, uh, they have uh, internalized the proper beliefs and attitudes or else they wouldn't be there. It's like when you do criticism of the media, you know, and you say, look, uh, here's what uh, Anthony Lewis or somebody else is writing, they get very angry. And they say quite correctly that nobody ever tells me what to write. I write anything I like. You know, all this business about pressures and constraints is nonsense because I'm never under any pressure, which is completely true. But the point is they wouldn't be in that position unless they had already demonstrated that nobody has to tell them what to write because they're going to say the right thing. Uh, and if they hadn't, you know, if they had started off at, uh, you know, at the metro desk or something and had pursued the wrong kind of stories, they never would have made it to the positions where they can now say anything they like. So nobody's telling them what to say, and the same is true of the university faculty and so on, but it's because they've been through the socialization system. Okay, well, you look at that structure, that whole system, what do you expect the news product to be like? Well, 
pretty obvious, actually. I mean, the, here's the New York Times. Uh, it's a corporation, sells a product. The product is audiences. They don't make money when you buy the newspaper. They're happy to put it on the World Wide Web for free. They actually lose money when you buy the newspaper. But uh, the audience is the product. Uh, the product is privileged people, just like the guys who are writing the newspapers, you know, top-level decision-making people in the society. And you have to sell a product to a market, and the market is, of course, advertisers, that is, other businesses. So whether it's television or newspapers or whatever, uh, they're selling audiences, it's corporations selling audiences to other corporations. And in the, in the case of the elite media, it's big businesses. So like, you know, not the corner grocery store, but big guys. Uh, well, what do you expect to happen? You know, you're a scientist from Mars looking at this institutional structure. What would your prediction be about the nature of the media product given that whole set of circumstances? it would obviously be kind of null hypothesis, you know, the assumption that you'd make, assuming no, nothing further, assumption, the obvious assumption has to be refuted, uh, is that the product of the media, what appears, what doesn't appear, the way it's slanted, you know, the, the whole story, will reflect the interests of the buyers and the sellers and the product uh, and the institutional and the power systems that are around them. I mean, if that wouldn't happen, it'd be kind of a miracle. So perfectly obvious assumption is that that's what happens. Okay, then comes the hard work. You look at the, you know, you see how they cover this and how they cover that and why they don't do this and why they don't do that. And you, and you ask, is, does it work the way you'd predict? And the answer is, well, you can judge for yourselves. There's lots of material on this. And these, you know, this obvious hypothesis has been subjected to the hardest tests anybody can think of. And it stands up remarkably well. You virtually never find anything in the social sciences that's as strongly supported as, the, as this conclusion, which is not a big surprise, because if it didn't, it would be a miraculous if it didn't hold up, given the way that the forces are operating. Uh, next thing you discover is that this whole topic is completely taboo. It cannot be discussed. I mean, if there's an academic media conference run by, you know, lefty pacifists or something, you can be certain that this topic will not arise, you know. Uh, if you go to the Kennedy School and the Media Institute or, you know, Stanford or somewhere and you study journalism or communications or, you know, academic political science and so on, these questions will never appear. That is the null hypothesis, the hypothesis that any idiot would come across without even knowing anything. That is not allowed to be expressed and the evidence bearing on it cannot be discussed. Well, you'd predict that too. If you look at the institutional structure, you would say, yeah, sure, that's got to happen, because why should these guys want to be exposed? You know, why should they allow uh, critical analysis of what they're up to to take place? And the answer is that no reason why they should allow that. In fact, is they don't. And again, it's not purposeful censorship. It's just that uh, you don't make it to those positions, even if you're on the left includes the left, as it's called the left, as well as the right, unless you have been adequately socialized and trained so that there's, or well put it, there's just some thoughts you don't have uh, because, and if you did have them, you wouldn't be in there. Uh, that works uh, as well, so you get kind of like a second order prediction that comes out and is well confirmed, is that the first order predictions are highly verified but never discussed, not allowed into discussion, makes perfect sense, you know, fits the nature of the institution. Uh, last thing to look at is uh, the um, kind of the doctrinal framework in which this proceeds. Like, is there thinking about it? Do people at high levels in the information system, including the media and advertising and academic social, you know, academic political science and so on, do these people have a picture of what ought to happen when they're writing for each other, not when they're making graduation speeches? You, know, you make a commencement speech, pretty words and stuff, but when you're writing academic articles or, you know, serious thought or something like that. What do people say about it? Well, actually, there's a good record of that, and it's interesting and consistent, and it goes exactly along with this picture. And it's, it's quite interesting to look at. So uh, there's basically three currents that you want to look at. One is uh, the public relations industry, you know, the main business propaganda industry. So what do those guys say? What do the leaders of the PR industry say? Second place to look is uh, what are called the public intellectuals, you know, the big thinkers who are supposed to, I don't know, the guys who write the op-eds and that sort of thing. Um, the, uh, so what do they say? Uh, the people who write, you know, impressive books about the nature of democracy and that sort of business. Uh, 
you look at that. Third thing you look at is the academic stream. And here it's uh, essentially the main place to look is that part of political science which is concerned with communications and uh, information and uh, you know that stuff, which is a branch of political science in the last 70 or 80 years. So take a look at those three things and see what they say. Then just look at the leading figures who have all written about this and they all say the same thing. Uh, uh, and it's kind of interesting. What they say is the basic picture is, look, the general population are these are just quotes, are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who have no, we have to keep them out of the public arena because they are too stupid and if they get involved they'll just make trouble. Uh, their job is to be uh, spectators, not participants. They're allowed to vote every once in a while, pick, pick out one of us smart guys, uh, but then they're supposed to go home and do something else like, you know, watch the football game or whatever it may be. Uh, but the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders have to be observers, not participants. The participants are what are called the responsible men. And of course the writer is always one of them. Uh, you never ask the question why I'm a responsible man and somebody else is in jail, let's say. But the answer is pretty obvious. It's because you are obedient and subordinate of the power and that other guy may be independent and so on. Uh, but th that you don't ask, of course. So there's the smart guys and we're supposed to run the show and the rest of them are supposed to be out and we should not succumb to, I'm quoting from an academic article, to, to democratic dogmatisms about people being the best judges of their own interests. They're not. They're terrible judges of their own interests, so we got to do it for them for their own benefit. And uh, it's very, it actually, it's very similar to Leninism. It translates almost exactly into the Leninist line, you know, the party dictatorship, we do things for you and you're too dumb to do it yourself and we're doing it in the interest of everyone and so on. And I suspect that that's part of the reason why it's been so easy historically for people to shift up and back from being a, you know, sort of enthusiastic uh, Stalinist to being a big supporter of uh, U.S. power. I mean, people go up and back without any difficulty. I mean, say the David Horowitz type, to take a current example. Uh, is very, it's very easy. You switch very quickly from one position to the other. And I think my suspicion is the reason is because it's basically the same position. You know, you're not making much of a switch. You're just making a different estimate of where power lies. You know, at one point you think it's here, another point you think it's here, you take the same position. Uh, well, that's the basic doctrine. How did it evolve? That also has an interesting history. Uh, a lot of it comes out of the First World War, which was a big turning point. First of all, it changed the position of the United States and the world scene considerably. I mean, around the turn of the century, the U.S. was, in fact, in the 18th century, the United States was, the, was already the richest place in the world. I mean, the uh, quality of life, say, you know, health, um, longevity, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, of uh, colonists in 18th century America, uh, that was not achieved by the upper classes in Britain until the early 20th century, I mean, let alone anybody else in the world. I mean, this country is extraordinarily wealthy and, you know, huge advantages. And by the end of the 19th century, it had by far the biggest economy in the world. But it was not a big player in the world scene. I mean, U.S. power sort of extended to the Caribbean islands, not, you know, parts of the Pacific, not much farther. Uh, during the First World War, the relations did change. I mean, they changed dramatically during the Second World War. The Second World War, the U.S. just took over the world. But the First World War, there was already a change. Uh, and in fact, the U.S. shifted from being a debtor to a creditor nation in the First World War. And it became a, not huge, it wasn't like Britain, but it became a substantial actor in the world, you know, for the first time. Uh, and uh, uh, that was one change, and inter but there, was, there were other changes. Uh, the First World War uh, uh, was the first time when there was really coordinated state propaganda, highly organized coordinated state <coughs> propaganda. It was first the British. The British had a Ministry of Information, and they really needed it because they had to get the United States into the war or else they were going to get in bad trouble. So they had a Ministry of Information which was mainly geared to uh, sending uh, propaganda, including huge fabrications about Hun atrocities and so on, and they were targeting American intellectuals on the reasonable assumption that these are the people who are most gullible and most likely to believe propaganda, <laughs> and they'll accept what we say, uh, which was true. 
uh, and they're also the ones who can then disseminate it and you know run their own system. So it was mostly geared to American intellectuals, and it worked very well. Uh, the British Ministry of Information documents have you know a lot of them been released, and their goal was, as they put it, to to control the thought of the entire world. That was minor goal, but uh, <laughs> mainly the United States. They didn't care much what people thought in India, you know, but it makes a lot of difference what they care, think in the United States. So they had this big Ministry of Information. It was extremely successful in um, diluting top hotshot American intellectuals into accepting British propaganda fabrications. They were very proud of that. Uh, properly so. It sort of saved their lives. They would have lost the First World War otherwise. Uh, in the United States, there was a counterpart. The Wilson, Woodrow Wilson was elected in 1916 on the platform. This is a very pacifist country. It has always, you know, doesn't want to, people don't want to go fight foreign wars. Uh, and the country was very much opposed to the First World War. And um, Wilson was, in fact, elected on an anti-war position. Uh, Peace without victory was the slogan. But he was intending to go to war. So the question is, how do you get the pacifist population to become, you know, raving anti-German lunatics, uh, so they want to go out and kill, every, kill all the Germans and so on. Uh, you have to do that, and that requires propaganda. So they set up the first, and in fact, really only major state propaganda agency in U.S. history, uh, Com Committee on Public Information. It was called, you know, nice Orwellian title, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's usually called the Creel Commission. The guy who ran it was named Creel, and this the task of this commission was to uh, Propagandize the population into becoming, uh, into drive the population to kind of like a, you know, jingoist hysteria and wartime frenzy, and it really worked. I mean, it worked incredibly. Uh, I mean, what happened in the country is unbelievable. But within a few months, uh, it's it worked, and the, the, there was a raving war hysteria, and the U.S. was able to go to war. Uh, the people who were involved in that, a lot of people were impressed by these achievements, a lot. Uh, one person who was impressed, and this has some implications for the future, was Hitler. Uh, if you read Mein Kampf, he describes this, and he concludes with some justification that Germany lost the First World War because it lost the propaganda battle. They could not begin to compete with uh, British and American propaganda, which absolutely overwhelmed them. And, you know, he pledges that next time around they'll have their own propaganda system and they'll which they did, and so it was more even competition during the Second World War. Uh, more important for us, uh, highly impressed, was the American business community. Uh, they were in, had a problem at that time. The country was becoming formally more democratic, you know, like a lot, of, a lot more people were able to vote and that sort of thing. Uh, and it was becoming wealthier, and, you know, more people could participate, uh, and a lot of new immigrants coming in and so on. So what do you do? Uh, it's going to be harder to run the thing as a, like a private club. Uh, therefore, obviously, you have to control what people think. Uh, there had been a public relations, there had been public relations specialists, but there was never a public relations industry. You know, so there was a guy hired to make Rockefeller's image look prettier and that sort of thing. But the real, this huge public relations industry, which is a U.S. invention and uh, a monstrous industry, uh, it uh, came out of the First World War, really. And the leading figures in it were people in the Creole Commission. In fact, the main one, Edward Bernays, uh, he comes right out of the Creole Commission. He, was, and he, he has a book that came out right afterwards called Propaganda. The term propaganda, incidentally, didn't have negative connotations in those days. Uh, it was during the Second World War that the term became taboo because it was, you know, connected to Germany and all those bad things. But in this period, and in fact in most of the world, propaganda, the term, the equivalent term to propaganda just means uh, like information or something. Uh, so he wrote a book called Propaganda in around 1925, and it starts off by saying he's applying the lessons of the First World War, the propaganda systems of the First World War, and this commission that he was part of uh, showed, he says, that it is possible, I'm quoting it actually, to regiment uh, the minds of men as well as armies can regiment their bodies. And these new techniques of regimentation of minds, he says, have to be used by the intelligent minorities, that's us, uh, in order to make sure that the slobs stay on the right course, you know. And now we can do it because we have these new techniques. And then he goes on to, and th this is in fact the main manual of the 
the public relations industry. He's kind of the guru. He remained so for a long time. An interesting career, which I could describe. He's a big hero among Cambridge liberals, I should say. He was an authentic uh, Roosevelt Kennedy liberal, you know, and very much honored in places like Brattle Square and places like that. Uh, very interesting history, but I'll come back to it. Uh, he's honored because he did things like saving the sycamores. You know, there was an attempt to <laughs> cut down the sycamore trees on Memorial Drive, which is where, you know, nice Cambridge people like to take a walk. And he carried out a public relations campaign which saved the sycamores. Got a lot of points. Uh, <laughs> he also uh, engineered, he engineered the public relations uh, effort behind the U.S., uh, the coup which overthrew the uh, democratic government of Guatemala. Uh, he was behind all that. Another big success. You know, ended up with hundreds of thousands of corpses and place ruined. And democracy dead forever. Uh, but his major coup, the one that really propelled him into fame, was in the late 20s. Uh, and that was getting women to smoke. Uh, women didn't smoke in those days. And he ran a huge campaign for Chesterfield, which, you know, all the techniques, I mean, models with cigarettes uh, coming out of their mouths and that kind of thing. And that had a big effect. He got a lot of women to smoke, you know, a huge number of corpses. And he got uh, uh, enormous uh, plaudits for that. Uh, so he's, uh, uh, but, but he remained like the leading figure of the industry. And this book was the real manual. Uh, another member of the Creel Commission was uh, Walter Lippmann, who was the, he's really the dean of American, you know, the leading figure in American journalism, the most respected figure in American journalism for about half a century. I mean, serious American journalism, the guy who wrote serious think pieces, you know, and that sort of thing. He also wrote what are called progressive essays on democracy, uh, regarded as progressive back in the 20s. And he was again applying the lessons of the wartime propaganda very explicitly. Uh, he says, uh, this, we have a new technique. He said there's a new art uh, of, in democracy called manufacture of consent. That's his phrase. Ed Herman and I borrowed it for our <laughs> book, but it comes from Lippmann. He says there's this new art in the method of democracy, manufacture of consent, uh, and that's the sort of core of democracy. That's the way it works, and that's by manufacturing consent, you can overcome the fact that formally a lot of people have the right to vote. We can make it irrelevant, you know, because we can manufacture consent and make sure that the only choices they have, the choices and attitudes will be structured in such a way that they'll always do what we tell them anyway, even if they have a formal way to participate. So we'll have a real democracy that will work properly. Uh, and that's, again, applying the lessons of the propaganda agency. Uh, academic social science comes out of this, political science comes out of the same thing. The sort of founder of uh, the field of what's called communications in academic political science, Harold Glasswell, his main achievement, you know, the thing that sort of propelled him into fame was a book on propaganda, study of propaganda. And uh, uh, he says very frankly the things that I was quoting before, those things about uh, not succumbing to democratic dogmatisms that comes from academic political science, Glasswell and these guys. Again, drawing the lessons from the wartime experience. Uh, political parties drew the same lessons especially the Conservative Party in England. Their early documents are just being released. Uh, but they also recognized the achievements of the British, British Ministry of Information. And they also recognized the same problem as here, that the country was getting more democratized and it wouldn't be a private men's club, maybe. So they had a problem. And the conclusion was, as they put it, that uh, uh, politic, uh, the elect, you know, politics has to become what they call political warfare, uh, applying the mechanisms of propaganda that worked so brilliantly during the First World War towards controlling people's thoughts and so on. And there's a whole routine that comes out of that. Well, you know, that's the doctrinal side. And it coincides with the institutional structure. And it gives you a, it strengthens the predictions about where the thing ought to work. And in fact, it does work. Uh, except these conclusions also are not allowed to be discussed. I mean, even this is all now mainstream literature. It's only for people on the inside. You don't let, like when you go to college, you don't read the classics about uh, uh, how to control people's minds, right? obviously. Just like you don't read what uh, James Madison said during the Constitutional Convention about how the main goal of uh, uh, the new system has to be to protect the uh, minority of the opulent against the majority. 
and the system has to be designed so that it achieves that end, and then he sort of lays down things. This is just the founding of the constitutional system, so nobody studies it. <laughs> I mean, in fact, you can't even find it in the, in the uh, academic scholarship, the whole thing that went on there, unless you really looked hard. Uh, but, okay, th I mean, that's roughly the picture as far as I can see. It's, this is the picture of the way the system is institutionally, the doctrines that lie behind it, uh, the way it comes out. There's another whole part which is directed to the, you know, to the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, and that's mainly diversion of one kind or another. Uh, and from that, I think you can sort of predict what you would expect to find, and then I think if you look, well, as I say, you can do it for yourself, but I think you more or less find what you'd expect to find. Yeah? You, uh, I think many of us feel that uh, we can go to work in these mainstream institutions, that we can go through colleges and universities, as long as we're aware of the kinds of things that you're talking about. Um, I completely agree. Or, or no, look, I mean, I agree. Why, why am I teaching MIT? You know, I mean, MIT is the Pentagon University. Uh, through the 1960s, let's say when Mike was a student, uh, and really uh, had a fantastic effect on the place. I mean, he and a couple other people like Steve Shalom and a few others just totally revolutionized the place, changed it forever. It's never been the same since. Uh, but at that time, uh, MIT was... Uh, well, I was actually on a committee at the time, which for the first time looked at MIT financing. The committee was set up as a result of the student activism to try to cut things, you know, calm things down by trying to do something, you know, the usual story. Uh, and uh, we did get access to the uh, funding records for the first time. Never really been looked at. Turned out that half, this is by memory, I may have the numbers sort of wrong, but it was 1969, and it's in print, you can check. My recollection is something like this, that about half the MIT budget came from two military laboratories, secret laboratories, uh, developing advanced guidance systems for intercontinental missiles and counterinsurgency for Vietnam and so on. That was half the budget. Of the other half the bu of the budget, about 90% came from the Pentagon. Okay. So this is Pentagon University. It was also the center of anti-war activism in, the, in this region. Everything, almost everything came out of MIT, very little out of Harvard, at the faculty level, at the student level, and so on. And that still remains the case for those of you who are in the Boston area. You're in the Boston area and you have a, you want to run a political meeting on something, you get a room at MIT, you know. That's a, it's a residue of the same phenomenon. And that's, you couldn't be more in the heart of the of power system than there. But that was the most, in fact, most of the resistance in the United States came, a lot of it came out of MIT. Uh, resist, you know, is at is in Boston because it was coming out of MIT. It was mostly MIT faculty and so on. So yeah, yeah it, it, this one example, but there are plenty of others. You can do. I mean, the systems are pretty porous. You know, I mean, they uh, they have a lot of internal contradictions that you that you can play on. Uh, I mean, so take the media. Uh, they uh, they have an internal contradiction, uh, keeping not to the elite media. They have to indoctrinate. You know, you've got to make sure that the responsible men are going to have the right thoughts. On the other hand, you also have to give them a tolerably realistic picture of the world because they're making decisions that matter to people with real power. And uh, you don't want them to make, dis make stupid decisions. You want them to make decisions that relate to reality. You know? So on the one hand, you have to give them a more or less realistic picture of the world. On the other hand, you have to indoctrinate them with a flood of lies. And that's just contradictory. Uh, and it's interesting, and it gives a lot of opportunities. Uh, there, some of the best investigative reporters in the country, I can't name names because they don't want to expose themselves, but people you would certainly know, and they're famous, they understand this system perfectly. You know? They're much more cynical about it than I am because they're on the inside and they see it every day. And they wait you know, for opportunities. Uh, and it, they sort of even understand when the opportunities come. Like there's a scandal every couple of years that you can't keep a lid on, you know, like Watergate or Iran-Contra or something. And any uh, top investigative reporter will tell you, if he's honest, that uh, what you do is you wait until there's a scandal. You store up your stories, you know. If there's a scandal, there's going to be a couple of months of, in which things are opened up a little bit, you know, and you can sort of sneak stories in, and they do that, you know. Uh, and uh, you sort of tune your story so they'll make it through and things like that. I mean, they recognize, you know, and in fact, if you look at the, uh, 
some of the best reporting in the country, in fact, I, th I think the best reporting in the country probably comes in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that's very honest. And not just on international affairs, on, say, working conditions in, uh, you know, sort of um, chicken factories where people are treated like slaves, you know, uh, ch you know that, those things. You, that's where you get the reporting of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, partly it's because uh, they trust their audience. You know, it's not going to matter too much if these guys uh, know sort of what's happening. And you want to give them a realistic picture. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we can read the Wall Street Journal too. And a good reporter on the Wall Street Journal knows this and will print things knowing that other people are going to look at it. Uh, and uh, same in the universities. I mean, there's lots of openings, the same in law firms, same everywhere. So take, say, the big law firms. I mean, you know, uh, Washington is more or less run by about half a dozen law firm, corporate law firms, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell and a couple of others. That's where most of the, uh, like the Secretary of State and, you know, the top bureaucrats, they usually come from those firms. This sort of makes sense because the people in those firms have a kind of a broad view of the general corporate interest, not a parochial view of General Motors' interest, that sort of thing. So they're all, 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 you know, right, I mean, they're the big power brokers and, you know, makers and so on and so forth. On the other hand, those law firms have to keep a public image. Uh, they, you know, they want, the, like they would like to get the bright students from Harvard Law School some of whom still haven't yet been completely socialized and, you know, think that you ought to do nice things for poor people and stuff like that. So they have to have a nice image. And they, in fact, most of them have public interest uh, activities, some of which are not bad, you know. Uh, and uh, that gives opportunities to do things. And besides that, there's just the simple question of professional integrity. I mean, after all, you know, these are human beings. I mean, they're not going to... Like I say, mostly they're not, they're not, they don't lie a lot. You have to believe the things you're saying. But there are people who uh, believe other things, and they want to tell the truth about that and uh, try to find ways to do it. So I entirely agree with you. There's a lot that you can do inside the institutions. On the other hand, the institutions are set up so that people who try to do those things are unlikely to make it through. They may, you know. And if they do, then there's a lot that they can manage. But by and large, they won't make it through. So while, uh, say, Walter Lippmann was writing about how the responsible men have to think this and that, uh, Eugene Debs was in jail. Uh, why was Eugene Debs in jail and Walter Lippmann writing about the responsible men? Well, because Walter Lippmann is obedient and does what he's told and so on and so forth. And Eugene Debs was the major labor leader in the country and he was, had a different constituency. You know, he was working for poor people. So he's in jail, you know. Uh, that's kind of the way it works. Incidentally, uh, no one who writes about this topic will point that out, although it's kind of obvious, uh, that Debs, the major labor figure and la labor leader in U.S. history, was jailed by Woodrow Wilson, you know, the great idealist, who indeed actually refused even when Wilson's term was over, you know, he sort of granted a Christmas amnesty to all sorts of, you know, more or less political prisoners and lots of others, but not Debs. Debs was the one he would not grant amnesty to, and in his secret records he says, why, this guy's got to stay in jail, you know, because he raised questions about the nobility of our uh, enterprise in the First World War, and he's not allowed to talk, period. So he's not responsible, he's in jail, wrong constituency, and Lippmann's a responsible man who, you know, writes big, you know, respectable essays and so on. I mean, that's the way it usually works. But if you do make it through, yes, there are a lot of things you can do. Is, is that the Achilles heel? Kind of? I mean, one. Yeah, it's, it just seems like I know for myself and I, I think for a lot of other people that the system, you know, uh, it's, it's systemic and the institutions within the system are so massive, you know, the, the, and, and so powerful and so all per pervading that, you, I mean, you can't take them all head on. And um, it's like, I don't know where. I, I this is probably a stupid question, but where can you make the most? Yeah, a lot of places. Yeah. A lot of places. Yeah. You can work from inside. You can work from outside. Yeah. I mean, like a totalitarian state will react to ferment at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. It'll have to. I mean, there is no power system, no matter how authoritarian it is, that can <laughs> ignore what's happening among the general population. 
you have to respond to that. And uh, ferment at the grassroots, wherever it is, in a college or in a community or in the country, will affect the way decisions are made. Uh, often very dramatically. I mean, so for example, uh, take say the, uh, the United States in the early, uh, take say the question of intervention, military intervention, invade, aggression, you know, call it by its right name, uh, aggression or international terrorism and so on. Uh, that was considered completely unproblematic in the early 60s. I mean, so unproblematic that to this day, uh, no educated person could, and if you, if you ask people, you know, try it, I ask some Harvard professor, uh, what was the, when did the United States invade South Vietnam? You know, what was the date? They don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, no such event took place. You know, how could it have a date? You know, well, of course, the event took place. You know, it took place um, late 61, early 62, when John F. Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Air Force, you know, like not mercenaries, uh, to bomb the South Vietnamese countryside and authorized the use of napalm and started crop destruction so that people wouldn't have food to eat and wouldn't support the guerrillas. No North Vietnam, no Russia or China. This is South Vietnam, which was always the main target of the U.S. attack. Uh, so yeah, that was U.S. attack against South Vietnam. I mean, it wasn't a secret. Like you could read in the New York Times that, uh, I mean, true on sort of the back page, but it was there that um, 30 percent of the missions uh, against the South Vietnamese countryside were being fought by, were being flown by U.S. pilots uh, in planes with South Vietnamese markings, so it wouldn't be so obvious that they're U.S. planes. It was right there. I mean, everybody knew about it. Uh, napalm you knew about, crop destruction you knew about. It's just there was no, pro nobody thought there was anything wrong with it. You know, like there's 20 people in the country who thought there's something wrong with this. And that went on for years. I mean, it, was, it wasn't, uh, you look at the history of the anti-war movement. I mean, it was not in, in a place like Boston, for example. As late as 1966, five years after that, we couldn't have public meetings against the war. Even with mild slogans like, you know, don't bomb North Vietnam or something, which was not the issue. Uh, you couldn't have them because they'd be physically broken up. In fact, mostly by students. Uh, from the big universities, with the applause of the media, like the liberal press would think that's terrific. Why let these guys talk? You know, uh, and that's five years after the uh, you know a couple hundred thousand American <coughs> troops marauding and so on. Uh, that's all gone. It's, you know, now that's totally inconceivable. In fact, when the uh, every new administration they have a strategic review, you know, sort of analyze the world situation. Occasionally, it leaks. If it doesn't leak, you have to wait 40 years, and if you're lucky, it'll be declassified. But the Bush administration won. <coughs> Parts of it leaked right away. Uh, actually, it came out during the Gulf War. In the middle of the Gulf War, there was a leak from somebody in the Pentagon, obviously, who uh, leaked the strategic analysis. And uh, what it said about intervention was that, uh, quoted, it said, uh, in the case of confrontation with much weaker enemies, meaning any confrontation we're ever going to get into, because we're not going to fight anybody who can fight, shoot back. So in the case of confrontations with much weaker enemies, uh, we must win rapidly and decisively, because anything else will undercut, if it goes on more than a couple of days, it's going to undercut political support. Okay? Well, that's a recognition of what I just said, internal recognition, that the days are gone when you can send the American Army and the American Air Force to uh, carry out massive uh, aggression and slaughter in other countries. Can't do it anymore. That's exactly why the Reagan administration had to uh, resort to what they call clandestine activities with mercenaries rather than overt aggression. Uh, and those are big changes and they, they just ref they're the changes in policy, you know, major changes in policy uh, which reflect uh, changes in the society that came out of uh, grassroots activism, you know. And that's just one example. There's tons of them. I was wondering what, uh, what comments you might have um, or what connections you might draw between the contemporary fervor to join uh, NATO and the and, uh, European Union trying to mm -hmm. gain solidity. Well, you know, NATO has always been a multidimensional sort of thing. It was presented as if it was a defense against the Russians, but that was a small piece of it. I mean, for one thing, nobody ever expected the Russians to attack. I mean, it was, there's never been an expectation that the Russians would attack unless it was in reaction to the threat of being destroyed. Like if we were, you know, they were, after all, the Russians were always encircled. Uh, and uh, there was a recognition that if the noose got too tight 
and they feel they're really in danger, they might kind of lash out. And that's the only condition under which anyone ever expected Russian aggression. Uh, so NATO was a, you know, it was a military alliance, but a large part of it was to try to keep Europe under control. Now, remember, there's a joint interest in keeping Europe under control on the part of U.S. policymakers and European elites. Of course, Europe, like any other place, is not an entity. There are different people in Europe who have different interests. Uh, and after the Second World War, this was particularly significant because, remember, the Second World War was a war, it's hard to remember now, but at the time, the Second World War was a war against fascism. Uh, and the people who fought that war were on the left. Uh, they were radical Democrats or socialists or communists, uh, labor-based, uh, peasant-based, and so on, all the bad guys. They're the ones who, that's the resistance. The resistance was anti-fascist. And that was a, had a lot of prestige at the end of the Second World War. And the old fascist establishment, the traditional establishment, had lost its prestige because of its association with Nazism and fascism. Well, that was the situation at the end of the Second World War when all this celebration about the Marshall Plan, you ought to remember that. The situation at the end of the Second World War is that the mass of the population was fairly radical. Um, you know, uh, kind of radical democratic in some general sense, sometimes called communist, whatever that means, sometimes not. But it was worker and peasant based, uh, and they just wanted a change in the society. They wanted a different world, you know, not a world without the traditional conservative order ruling them. Uh, well, plainly, the U.S. was not going to have that, you know. So, in fact, the first chapter of post war history, if there was an honest post war history around, which there isn't. Actually, there are a few, like Gabriel Calco and a couple others, but I mean, you know, like nothing that you read in college. Uh, if there was an honest one around, the first chapter of uh, post-war history would be the, ch the effort to destroy the European anti-fascist resistance and to restore the fascist order. That's exactly what was done. I mean, it started even before the end of the war, as the Ameri American troops were coming up through, American and British troops through Italy. That was the, you know, first invasion of the continent was southern Italy. The uh, first thing they did was restore the fascists, uh, literally. You know, so southern Italy was put under the control of Field Marshal Badoglio, who was a great fascist war hero, Ethiopian war, and so on. The king, who was very pro-fascist, was brought back. Actually, the mafia was reconstructed. The uh, fascists run a tight ship. They don't like opposition, so they eliminated the mafia. It was restored as a control measure. Uh, as the British and the Americans moved towards northern Italy, they ran into a real problem because northern Italy had been mostly liberated by the resistance, which was no, no joke in Italy. It was a strong movement. And they had kind of driven out about six or seven German divisions uh, and had liberated most of northern Italy so that by the time the American British troops got up there, they had to disperse the resistance, not the Nazis. Uh, and they did. It was uh, already self-governing, you know, with workers' control and all kind of things going on. That wasn't going to be accepted. So they were thrown out. Actually, the British Labor Party, which was in office then, their, their representative was particularly appalled because uh, uh, workers, you know, the, the workers were having a voice in industry. Uh, and they, um, they were getting rid of bosses, you know, and uh, they had... Uh, uh, I have a lot of material on this in books I can cite if you like, but they, they had to get rid of these guys. And the same was true throughout the whole of Europe. You had to get rid of the, old, of the resistance. Sometimes it was very bloody, like in Greece about 160,000 people were killed in this effort in the late 40s. And then uh, the other side is you had to restore the traditional order, which meant fascist collaborators, outright Nazis, and so on. Uh, well, it's in that context that NATO was formed. So when you say uh, Europe, you know, depends which Europe you're talking about. Uh, the uh, uh, the elite elements wanted NATO as a way of ensuring control of Europe, the same way the Americans wanted NATO as a way of controlling Europe, a certain kind of Europe, you know, not a different kind of Europe. Uh, that a large part of NATO was about that. Another part of NATO was uh, they had a big problem with Germany. I mean, Germany was obviously the most, it was in fact considered the natural leader. Of, that's the way it was called in U.S. planning documents, and obviously is. It's the most dynamic, powerful state. I mean, Germany practically conquered the world. You know, if it, I mean, uh, in terms of technological capacity and so on, they, the Americans and British were astonished at what the Germans were able to do. 
uh, and they respected it. You know, they respected the Nazis and they respected their achievement. Uh, but the prob but the trouble is, you can't. You know, they're too much of a threat. So they had to be incorporated within some kind of a European alliance and balanced off again. France was scared to death of them, you know, for pretty obvious reasons, and Britain too. Uh, and they had to somehow be incorporated. Into, well, partly that was achieved by splitting Germany, which is mostly a Western initiative. But it's still the, the rich, powerful part of Germany was in the West, and they had to be handled somehow. So NATO was a framework in which Germany could be integrated into the system as its sort of dynamic center, but not a military threat to its neighbors. Uh, and uh, a lot, that's a lot of what lies behind NATO. Now, getting to the NATO expansion, it's kind of more of the same. You know, it's uh, trying to extend this conception of what Europe should be like to a broader area. Uh, Eastern Europe is the <coughs> traditional third world. You know, it's the, it's the earliest third world before there was, you know, back to the 15th century, it was Europe's service area. And parts of it have to be reincorporated into uh, the dominant regions, others have to be subordinated. And NATO expansion is sort of, uh, you know, what's behind it. There's no military purpose to it at this point. You know, there wasn't much ever, in my opinion, but certainly isn't now. But its political purposes remain, and in fact expand. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a master's student in, um, in communication, and my name's Shane, by the way. And um, Hi. <laughs> where? Uh, in Tampa, Florida, mm -hmm. University of South Florida. And I'm now that I've gotten into my program, I've noticed that as I'm studying critical theory, they're just focusing on Marxism. We get to read a little bit of Noam Chomsky. We go on to read the usual place. <laughs> Michael Albert really opened my eyes to um, combining. Uh, things and, and moving on, but with with the uh, possible death of tenure, um, um, do you see more institutes like this being the only way really for us to to get any other sort of education? I keep thinking that if I do go off my PhD and I get in there, uh, and this tenure melts away, there's no way that anyone who isn't repeating what Pentagon wants them to say or or the capitalists want them to say that it's going to be able to stay. Actually, I happening? think, first of all, I think pen, uh, tenure probably is going to go, but not because of, you know, for other reasons. Uh, tenure is probably going to go because of the success of the people like us mm -hmm. in overcoming discrimination. Mm -hmm. So one of the forms of discrimination that was ended was age discrimination. Okay, so now you can't throw anybody out on the basis of age any longer, okay? Which is a good thing, but it has various effects. Uh, one effect is that inside the, if you look at it from inside the universities, I mean, you know, fact of the matter is a lot of this, maybe most of the smart work is done by graduate students and young faculty. And, you know, over the years, the older faculty mostly loses interest or starts doing something else or I don't know what. And they end up on committees and you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of departments have a lot of dead wood in them. People haven't done anything for 30 years. Well, it's not a huge problem if you know that they're going to get rid of them at age 65, okay? So then there's useful things they can do around the university and can hang on. If they're going to stay on forever, you're in trouble. You can't have a, you can't bring in young people to keep the place alive, you know? And to keep the sciences going and so on, especially in the, you know, the things like the sciences, for example, you, you need a lot of young people around because that's where most of the ideas are coming from. Uh, and sometimes, some, so, so the universities are trying various things like buying off senior faculty. Uh, almost every big university I know has some kind of program to try to induce the senior fac faculty to retire early. And not, it doesn't mean early anymore. It means like maybe late 60s or something. Uh, and you can make a lot of money that way. I mean, like students of mine have retired all over the place with huge, uh, huge amounts of money given to them. And then they maybe take a second job somewhere else or you know, maybe continue doing the same thing, anything. But now, this can't go on forever. You know, it's, gonna, it's not a viable system. So sooner or later, um, the success in overcoming discrimination, which is a good success, is going to lead to the abolishing of tenure, which is a bad effect, uh, because it's going to eliminate protection for people who were, did break out of the system. That's, you know, the world's a complicated place. You can't fine tune it. So I think it's, very, it's in the cards that tenure will be eliminated. Then what happens? 
well, uh, you know, then it turn, it's going to turn out that the amount of freedom that will exist will depend on public support. And that's the place to build it. You know? uh, as to where you can get alternative things, it's uh, through, uh, very, you, it's very hard to do it alone. You know, you're sitting somewhere alone in the middle of, uh, you know, Texas or someplace or South Florida. It's pretty hard to have the uh, energy or the resistance or the, uh, you know, uh, resources even to try to work your way through a massive propaganda system. But when you're doing it with other people, it's not that hard. Uh, that was one of the great achievements of the labor movement. You know, enable. I mean, labor movement used to have workers' education or all sorts of things, and it's a way for people to get together and collectively look at the world in a different way. And I think that's going to continue. Um, the Central America Solidarity Movement, for example, which is a very big movement, uh, that just offered modes of interaction, a lot of it, most of it through churches, in fact, uh, which gave people a lot of knowledge and understanding. And the same is true on just about anything I know of, whether it's economics or you know, international affairs or welfare programs or whatever. I mean, these are collective activities. If, if the organizations and the structures exist, people can do a lot of things. And, I, and to the extent that they're strong and active and dynamic, they'll also leave protect spaces within the mainstream institutions, the media and the uh, actually independent journalists, and there are plenty of them. They very much rely on public support. You know, like if they, uh, if the public's, you know, people are banging down the doors of the editorial office, they'll allow them more space. And then what they do helps generate the movements. You know, it's a lot of interaction. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on the relationship between Western mass media and cultural imperialism in developing countries, and what role international communications laws play in that? Yeah, that's a. It's very complicated. I just got back from South Africa a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, while I was there, I spent some time with, as uh, much time as I could, with local activists, you know, people who work in the townships where the poor, shanty towns where the poor people are and so on. And there's a very live community radio program there. Uh, there's one big Cape Town, this big community radio station, which uh, is the station that broadcasts to the townships. Townships are, you know, right outside the city. You get these massive areas, which nobody ever sees, where people are living in conditions you can't even describe. Uh, but, uh, uh, and the, the, uh, the cities themselves are pretty wealthy. Uh, the, uh, so the community radio is poor people inside and in the townships. And they're very lively and active, a lot of black people. And in South Africa, they have black and what they call colored, you know, means India or you know, slaves that the Dutch brought from Malaya and so on that's called colored. So black and colored sectors who are often at each other's throats, it's not so simple, uh, they, uh, that's what the community radio is. But one of the problems they have, the guy who was you know, sort of organized was telling me that if you let young people, black, especially black, young blacks, run their own programs, they're pretty soon going to be following their role models. And their role models, believe it or not, are American blacks, who they think are really the peak of the world. You know, they don't know how blacks live in the United States. What they see, blacks for them, means what they see on television. So it's Michael Jordan, you know, and the uh, big rap artist and all that kind of stuff. So that's what they're going to do, you know, because that's what they really has prestige. And they kind of dress like that and styles like that, and they want that music and so on, because that's their ideal, you know, to be like an American black. Know, great ideal for a 18 or 20 year old kid, but uh, if you can consider the picture of America that they have, yeah, not too surprising. Well, that's a very dangerous kind of cultural imperialism. That's just one aspect of it, and it's very, it's very serious. You know, it erodes uh, popular movements and their own integrity and developing their own cultural institutions and so on. It's a big problem throughout the world. On the other hand, there's counter tendencies which are sometimes pretty surprising. Like take, say, Brazil, a uh, big country. Uh, Bra uh, Brazil uh, has apparent, uh, American soap operas and that kind of stuff, US, you know, this kind of stuff, has swept a lot of the world. Like if you're in a, you know, you're in a hotel somewhere around the world, which I 
find myself being much more than I want to. And you turn on television, you usually get some piece of American crap. Uh, not in Brazil. Uh, and the reason is apparently Brazilian soap opera is even worse than American ones. You know? <laughs> and they've swept the field. In fact, all through Latin America and parts of the you know, the, uh, parts of southern Europe, uh, people are tuned into the Brazilian junk, you know. Uh, and it's apparently, you know, it, like in Nicaragua during the 80s and the Sandinista years, uh, they, every news, I mean, you walk through the streets, it's an outdoor country, you know, you walk through the streets and the poor areas and so everything's outdoors, you s hear what's going on. Everybody, people may be extremely poor, but they almost always have a television set. And it's almost always tuned to something like a Brazilian soap opera. Uh, and in fact, the Sandinista newspaper listed every day, the, uh, still does, but uh, the content of you know, this soap opera, this person's going to have uh, you know, an affair with somebody and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so it, there you have, if you want, Brazilian cultural imperialism. Uh, but it's just, uh, so, so there, it's not that like it swept everything, but it certainly had an enormous effect. And f it's quite conscious. So when uh, India, a couple of years ago, what they did what they called liberalize, you know, like opened up the economy to take over by foreign corporations. Uh, the first thing that the U.S. corporations did when they moved in was take over the advertising industry. Uh, first move. So, uh, in fact, the whole public relations industry in India, which is substantial, was taken over by big U.S. corporations. Okay, so you go to India, it was about a year ago, and all you see is ads for American you know, clothes and food and all this kind of stuff. And that, uh, you know, it changes attitudes. I mean, it has the effect of changing attitudes. These guys know what they're doing. You know, they have a lot of experience. Uh, the result is that uh, uh, Indian-made products get undercut and swept aside by often more expensive and worse uh, U.S. products. Uh, because these are the prestige items. You, actually, in most of the world, McDonald's is considered a very fancy restaurant. Uh, when McDonald's gets into a country, people start having their wedding parties there and that sort of thing. Uh, that's no joke. Even in Europe, even in Europe, you know, uh, it's uh, somehow the, the, the propaganda and the imagery and the associations and you know the association with wealth, particularly and with glamour and so on and so forth. Uh, that has a major effect, and it's a very destructive one. Uh, it's, uh, I have yet to see a part of the, um, almost no part of the world where that's not true in my experience. Some of you, I'm sure a lot of you have been around in places and can t talk, but it's all over. When I was in Brazil recently, they uh, uh, were just getting, the, they were compelled under the liberalization to open up, uh, you know, the, these video things that you stick in a television set, what do you call them? Yeah, yeah the, you want to watch a movie on, whatever they are, yeah, okay. They had to open it up to some big American, uh, big U.S. firm, I forget what the name of the firm is, but there's some one here that, you know, controls a lot of the U.S. market, which they were forced to allow to set up stores in Brazil and Blockbuster, yeah. So they're now opening up down there and everybody's afraid they're going to take over that market, you know. Uh, uh, they're working very hard to change tastes and attitudes. It's another reflection of the same understanding that you can regiment minds and structure attitudes and limit perspectives. And once you've done that, you know, then everything else sort of goes along. So yeah, it's no joke. It's seen as market development in a sense. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's a lot more than market development. It's really structuring thoughts and attitudes. So it is partly selling goods but, you know, partly changing the way people think or what their aspirations are. I mean, you try to change people's aspirations so that the big goal in life is to wear the same kind of sneakers that Michael Jordan does, you know, not to run your own society, but let's then see. Then why is it that in Cuba, every Thursday night, everybody tunes into the big uh, Brazilian soap opera that's like Dallas? Yes, like if the, what happened? If you're shaping thoughts and aspirations, What's going on that Cuba is wanting to shape thoughts and aspirations? It's not to Cuba work? wants to. I mean, they're forced to. Who's Cuba? You know, I mean, the leadership in Cuba would be perfectly happy to let them watch propaganda films, but people won't accept it. They want to watch the Brazilian soap opera, like in Nicaragua. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, these things are very seductive. You know, 
Uh, exactly why it works, I don't know, but uh, that it does work is quite clear. I mean, I, look, I remember f uh, 40 years ago, a long time ago, uh, in early 1950s, I was, uh, I forget exactly, was this when I was, no, it might, well, I don't, I don't know when this happened, maybe around 1960, around that time, uh, the kibbutzim in Israel, you know, these collectives in Israel, uh, they uh, have a meeting every, s they, it, the tradition for many years was that Saturday night there's a meeting of the entire collective where they sort of do planning, you know, because they're collectives, they used to be, not anymore, but they used to be authentic collectives in which you do common planning about things that matter for the community, whether it's child care or agriculture or whatever, and the meeting was always Saturday night. Uh, sometime, you know, back whenever it was, uh, they had to make a decision around the whole, in the big kibbutz movements, to change the Saturday night meeting to a different night. And the reason was that at 9 o'clock on Saturday evening, they played an American cop show on television, Kojak. So, if those of you who know this culture will know, that'll date when it happened. Uh, so, okay, they had to delay the meetings of the collectives to put them off to a different night because everybody wanted to go home and watch Kojak. You know. These are the, you know, the left radical collectives. <laughs> it's, uh, the stuff is extremely seductive, there's no doubt about it. And it's uh, pushed for all it's worth. And it does uh, have certain, a certain picture the world is presented. So a lot of the world, people think Dallas is the way Americans live, you know? A, a friend of mine who lives in Norway told me that uh, Norway was the last country in Europe, apparently, which still wasn't playing, you know, Dallas or yes. one of these things. You, you, you know that? Norwegian. Right, yeah. <laughs> and there was so much popular uproar about it that they had to allow it at some point. So at one point, whenever it was, they had, I think, 15 weeks of uh, dynasty or one of those things. You know, it was, and this guy said that's all anybody talked about for, for a couple of months is what's the next episode of this going to be? You know. And that is the picture that people have of what the United States is like. They want to they live like that, so we'll do what those guys tell us. How do you fight against that kind of seduction? Is it human nature? It's very hard. Is it human nature? I mean, I th it's not human nature. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, I mean, human nature can do lots of different things. But it does require uh, general, real resistance. I mean, you're fighting against enormously concentrated power with tremendous wealth behind it and a lot of capacity to uh, penetrate. And people have to be able to... I mean, it's the same... Look with your... If you're on children, it's the same thing. How do you keep from them from being caught up in this stuff? It's, uh, it, it goes from that to, uh, you know, whole cultures. Like my daughter, her kids just do not watch television, period. It's a rule. Uh, and they've accepted it, you know. I mean, they see it in their friends' houses and so on, but the television set is not on in their house, period. Well, it's one way to do it. Uh, it, it seems as though I get in a lot of... Uh, so, wait, one second. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Boys can be quite frustrating. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I was just wondering if you could... Um, talk a bit more about the filtering process in the media institutions, like exactly what obstacles what happens? exist in I just saw a dramatic example of it just today, in fact. Uh, Gary Webb, this guy on the San Jose Mercury News who broke the uh, cocaine CIA story uh, a couple of months ago, whenever it was, you remember that whole business. The San Jose Mercury News, small not so small, but you know, not a major newspaper in California. Uh, Gary Webb, who's an investigative reporter there, came out with a series of stories on the uh, two things, on the CIA cocaine connection in Central America. So um, CIA was fer sending arms down to Central America to you know, various mercenaries and in return pay for services rendered. <coughs> they were allowed to smuggle drugs I mean, not smuggle, you know, send drugs back to the United States and U.S. planes land at Homestead Air Force Base and that sort of thing. And that was the trading relation. Uh, that was part of the story. The other half of the story was that he tied this up with the uh, uh, rise of the big crack epidemic in, uh, epidemic in Los Angeles. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a pretty dramatic story. I mean, it wasn't going to get anywhere. 
except that San Jose Mercury News happens to be tuned to contemporary media, and they got it over the internet, and people picked it off the internet, and then it kind of exploded into a big story, led to a lot of protests in the black community, uh, who kind of misinterpreted it. I mean, they in interpreted it as meaning the CIA was trying to spread cocaine in the black community, but that's not what the story was or what the facts are. I mean, it's kind of like a byproduct. Uh, but they were connected, in fact. Uh, well, that uh, expose led to a huge counterattack on the part of the major media. Uh, they really went after him with a vengeance. Uh, so it was a big attack in the New York Times and the Washington Post about this terrible story, which was sullying American journalism by not living up to our high standards, you know, because he spelled somebody's name wrong or something like that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that both of these stories, he did make a connection, but the which is however strong it is, but the two stories were well known but suppressed. So the drug, uh, the CIA drug story was broken by, in 1985, by Bob Parry, who was at that time a very, main, you know, respected mainstream journalist in Newsweek, and he, and his associate, AP associate, did break the story, but the media suppressed it. In fact, he's mostly thrown out. He now doesn't work in the media any longer, which is part of the answer to your question. Uh, but uh, that whole story was sort of suppressed. Leslie Coburn, is a, she's an investigative reporter, used to work for CBS. She kind of pursued it further and did an interesting book on it about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. But again, it was kind of suppressed. Uh, so the media have been able to sit on the story. Uh, they couldn't sit on the story of the explosion of crack in the cities, because that's too obvious. But uh, they, sat on, they, they did suppress the main story, you know, the CIA drug story. And the fact that the two things were sort of correlated, that a lot of the same people were involved, and there was obviously an interaction, that was never reported. They went after Webb, a uh, big attack against him. Uh, finally, uh, they com somehow or other, the, um, you know, the editor of the San Jose newspaper was uh, agreed or was compelled, or I don't know what happened. Anyway, he did publish a sort of a apology in his own newspaper saying, well, this didn't meet our standards and so on. That was immediately splashed over the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post, you know, we're vindicated. I mean, the whole issue in the mainstream was did this guy do the story exactly right or did he exaggerate, you know, did it go a little beyond this data at one point and so on. It was not, did, have we suppressed this fact for 15 years? That was not the story and that still is not the story. Well, today, uh, in the newspaper, it was announced, the little item says, uh, uh, Gary Webb, he had a new series of stories coming out on it. He's continued to work on it, and he's got a new series of stories coming out, extending it, but they're not going to let him publish it. In fact, he was uh, sent off to another, you know, police reporter, he's taken off these, he's not allowed to write on this anymore. Well, that's a, to, you know, an example right now of uh, how it works. Uh, that's a filtering, uh, that's a filtering system. He got out of line. Uh, if it hadn't been publicized, nothing much would have happened. But when it did become publicized and a huge counterattack came from the powerful institutions, uh, support for him crumbled. Now, he is supported in the, you know, the black ghettos in Los Angeles, but that's not the kind of support that protects you. You've got to be supported by more substantial sectors of privilege. Uh, and, and that, that's uh, maybe an extreme example, but it's typical. Uh, furthermore, I, I would imagine that most of you know all of this from your own personal experience. I mean, just think from early childhood and schools. I mean, you know, who's the behavior problem and who gets ahead? I mean, unless you've had a very unusual experience, uh, you've done the same thing I did. Uh, the way you get ahead is by saying, okay, the assignment is ridiculous. The teacher's an idiot. Uh, everything he's telling me is a lie, but I'm going to do it anyway because I want to go to college. Okay? I mean, that kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, there are people who don't do it. They say, look, teacher's an idiot. The assignment's ridiculous. He's telling us lies. I'm not going to do it. You know? Well, they're behavior problems. You know? Or they're, uh, if they're poor, they're thrown out in the streets. If they're rich and they have parents who know how to manipulate the system, you know, parents, I, mean, I have to admit, I did it myself with my son. I'm not particularly proud of it. You know how to manipulate the system. You got enough prestige. You can sort of get the kid through somehow, you know. 
Uh, and, uh, but uh, this is the way, I mean, if, I'm, if you haven't had experiences like that, I'm very surprised. I think if you think back, almost everybody like us has had experiences like that. And that's the filtering process. Uh, if anybody here who has made it to an elite college has made it because they were willing to be passive and obedient, uh, maybe not inside, like you may say, okay, I'll go along because I want to get ahead, but at some level you have to. Otherwise, you just don't get through. <coughs> and, uh, and that filtering process goes right on through the media and through, the, through graduate school and through the professions and so on. And I can tell you case after case that I've been involved in personally of graduate students and young faculty uh, who have uh, essentially been killed off by the system, system because they'd simply refuse to conform. Some of the stories are pretty amazing. Well, let me tell you one because I think she won't mind anymore if I tell it. I don't like to talk about this because individuals, you know, they have their lives to lead. But there's one uh, in, at MIT. Uh, I'm what's called an institute professor, which means technically I'm non-departmental, so I get to supervise a dissertation in any department. And if a student in, say, engineering or math or someone asks me to be on a committee, it's no big problem because they don't care. You know, it's fine. On the other hand, if a student from political science asks me to be on a committee, uh, the whole place explodes. You know. <laughs> uh, and uh, a few students have tried, but the only ones who have ever succeeded are third world women. And there's quite there's a good reason for that. Uh, for one thing, they're tough or they wouldn't have made it to MIT. And another thing is that they have a certain amount of leeway because people don't want to be too overtly racist and sexist, you know, so you get a little space. And they're tough anyway or they wouldn't have made it. So there are several third world women who have succeeded in getting me on a PhD committee. Uh, it usually doesn't last very long, but there's one in particular who was very tough, uh, Marsha Coleman, her name was, uh, who comes out of, you know, black urban Boston, worked her way up, very smart, worked her way up to MIT. Uh, she wanted to do a thesis uh, some years ago, on maybe 20 years ago or so, on uh, 15 years ago, on media coverage of the uh, Steve Biko assassination in South Africa. Okay. And she wanted, and that, you know, it's exactly the kind of topic I work on. I'm a perfectly natural person to uh, be on the committee. Well, you know, the department went totally berserk. I mean, first of all, because of the, the, the topic, which they couldn't stand, and uh, secondly, because I was on it. Uh, but she insisted, you know, she's sort of very tough. She insisted on going through, I'll never forget the first, we had, there was a, uh, when you present, when, in the political science department, it's not quite as bad now as it was then, uh, you, you, the, there's a kind of routine in which the student who has a thesis topic presents the thesis topic to the department, says, this is the topic I want to work on. I mean, usually nobody even shows up, you know, like maybe your mother shows up or the, <laughs> you know, the supervisor, the dissertation and so on. And when she presented it, there was a notice went around to the whole department saying, everybody's got to come, you know. So everybody in the faculty had to come because I was going to be there and they got to make sure they outnumber me about 40 to 1 or something. <laughs> and besides, she's a really dangerous type. So everybody showed up and uh, she announced her thesis topic and somebody asked her, well, what's your hypothesis? You know, you have to have a hypothesis. This is a big science. Uh, so uh, she said, well, her hypothesis is that media coverage of the Biko assassination would reflect U.S. business interests in South Africa. And it was kind of like a hush fell over. The <laughs> people turned red. You know, I thought they were going to explode or something. Uh, but, um, you know, finally people calmed down enough to start uh, throwing things at her and so on. But she withstood it. And, uh, and it, they couldn't stop her. You know, you can't just come out and say, look, you're not allowed to work on that, period. You know, that's, doesn't, you don't get by with that. Uh, well, what happened from then on was a charade. I mean, I kept talking, she kept coming, you know, see me all the time, describe what's happening. I mean, they kept putting new conditions on, you know, crazy requirements. Uh, you have to do something, this, you're supposed to do something called content analysis. I don't know if any of you are in political science, but there's some total nonsense called content analysis, which you count up all sorts of words and doesn't tell you a thing, you know, but as a big statistical apparatus and you have a lot of numbers and wastes a lot of time and so on. So instead of sort of reading what the, uh, what it doesn't have anything to do with, incidentally, is content. 
I think that's probably why it's <laughs> called the content analysis. So it's not like let's read the editorial and see what it says, you know, but let's count up the number of times that this word appears <laughs> and that word appears and so on and so forth. Uh, so she was, they, they forced her to waste huge amounts of time on statistical apparatus and, you know, raising the requirements of proof so you couldn't meet them in quantum physics and so on and so forth. And she kept wondering, you know, we kept talking about how to do it. I kept telling her, look, just do it, you know, do whatever they tell you and get through and go live your life. Uh, and finally, she sort of worked her way through and did make it through with a thesis that had most of the important material cut out because they wouldn't allow it in. Like she had extremely interesting interviews with uh, journalists, American white journalists from here who were covering South Africa. Uh, one really fascinating one was with uh, uh, the, the Christian Science Monitor had a, a woman reporter in South Africa, I think was her name, Jane Goodwin or something like that, uh, uh, who was pulled out by the Monitor uh, and because of her reporting. And uh, Marsha interviewed her and her editor. It's kind of like a Rashomon story. So she interviewed the woman and the editor who pulled her out and they gave their version of what happened. Uh, the editor's version was, well, she was getting too emotionally involved and she was becoming irresponsible and, you know, not meeting our journalistic standards and so on, so she pulled them, they had to pull her out. You know. Her version, she's a good reporter, and she's out of the media since, uh, her version was that she, uh, the way you reported from South Africa was you lived in a rich suburb of, you know, Johannesburg with six servants and a fancy house and you went down to the, you know, met the nice right people at the right bar and so on and that's how you reported from South Africa. Uh, she started uh, doing things which they told her she couldn't do. She wanted to sit, go out into the rural, into the country. <laughs> We're supposed to stop or what? No. Oh. Finish your sentence. Uh, she, uh, <laughs> Finish your sentence. <laughs> okay. she, uh, she, she decided she was going to go out into the townships, you know, with the black people live, or into the countryside to see what it's like. Uh, people told her, you can't do that, you'll get killed, you know, they're all monsters and so on. But she went and everything was fine, treated nicely, and she started reporting what life is really like. Well, at that point, uh, uh, you know, things began to blow up in South Africa. Uh, pe people didn't like her reporting, and there was pressure put on the newspaper, both from South Africa and from here, to have her withdrawn. And finally, they withdrew her. Okay, well, that's the story. Uh, this is part of Marsha's dissertation. She also had a very interesting interview with Anthony Lewis, New York Times reporter, who goes there for his vacations all the time. Uh, and uh, I think his wife is South African or something. But, uh, and that was interesting, a lot of interesting. None of that stuff was allowed in the thesis. You know, and she finally accommodated and did get through. And uh, since Mike is standing there and telling me to shut up, I won't tell you the rest of the story. But the, she did make it through to a fancy university and couldn't survive uh, just because of faculty pressure uh, in very ugly ways. She's now working in South African oriented NGOs. You know. That's the kind of thing, that's the way filtering works. You know, a lot of cases like him, he could have. He could have been a fancy physicist if he wanted to, you know, steady his time. <laughs> 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 okay. The other class is stopping now. You do whatever you Okay. We'll take a break, but this will start a few I've got two yeah. brief questions. The one is I first saw or heard of you, in fact, um, on C SPAN. Mm -hmm. of, of all places, and uh, I don't know much about the ownership and control of C-SPAN, but it, it, just looking back on it sort of surprises me, given the things you generally say and the things you were saying that night, generally criticizing corporations uh, and their control in the American economy. And what, <coughs> just out of curiosity, what time did you hear it? Uh, it, was, it was, it was in fact fairly late in the evening yeah. in December of no, two just, years uh, ago. No, that's usually the run I like two o'clock in the morning or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the fact of the matter, if we'll come back to the second later, See, uh, the guy, I, I don't exactly know the whole structure of C-SPAN, but uh, the guy in charge is a pretty open-minded guy. I know I sort of have an open invitation every time I'm in Washington to come in there to be on their interview shows and that sort of thing. The pro kind of programs that you saw, uh, C-SPAN, however it works, I'm not quite sure how it works, maybe it's federally funded or something, but they've got a lot of time 
and they're looking for fill. So if anybody uses any enterprise, you know, you just put a little initiative out, you can often get stuff on CISPEN. I mean, I've been on a lot, and it's mostly because the local, you know, mostly when I give talks, it's to some, mm -hmm. you know, some local groups organizing it. And if they have enough initiative, uh, they can get on CISPEN. And then it gets all over the country, and, you know, I start getting tons of letters from all over. It has a good effect, but it takes some initiative. I mean, I remember recently, I, about a year ago, I, was, I gave a talk at Martha's Vineyard. And uh, whoever it was, some young guy who organized it, uh, just, I guess he just called. Then they use their own local. Pe they don't send. They don't send any technicians. Out. You know, they don't send any cameramen out or anything like that. But there's all everywhere. There's local people who do that kind of stuff. You know, and so they got some local people to do the technical side, and then I don't know, sent off the tape and suspend ran it. In fact, reruns it over and over. You know, because they have to uh, fill a lot of space, and they're not opposed. In fact, you can get just about anything on there. I think. However, it's. Uh, I understand it's going to get cut out the, with the consolidation of the media. They're cutting down on showing suspend, uh, and, and a lot of places are dropping it. You just can't get on, you know, through the Murdoch network and so on. And as it gets more commercialized, I presume those channels will be cut out. But for the moment, they up till now the. It's one of the many resources that the left hasn't used that are available, and there are many. You know, I mean, with all the talk about how awful the media are, uh, there are a lot of things that people like us have not done that could be done. One of them's this, but there's a lot more. My second question is a direct follow-up to that, and mm -hmm. that is, if the left, <coughs> or generally people who, who believe that they ought to control the decisions that affect their lives, are to, to really make that the predominant value in this country, um, if they're going to be successful at doing that, it seems like media is a, going to have to be a big part. Mm -hmm. And so, in addition to, for example, using C-SPAN, what sort of things in the media? have to happen? And, and is it generally realistic to expect that these things can happen? Oh, a, look, even within, without changing a thing, you know, just within present rules and regulations, there's an awful lot that can be done. So take, say, Cambridge, where I live, Mass. Uh, they, like, I guess, just about every city in the country, there's a cable television station. Part of the uh, original uh, Communications Act back whenever it was, you know, 20 years ago, had a provision that said that in order to get a grant to uh, cover some area, the <coughs> cable companies had to put in public access television on cable. And it, a lot of communities have the, uh, uh, maybe all, you know, have these cable television stations. I've been in them occasionally. I mean, they're, you know, I, I'm not a high-tech freak, I don't know. But even I can tell they've got good equipment. You know, they've got plenty of equipment, plenty of technology. They reach out, you know, not huge, but like the Cambridge one covers the Cambridge area. It's probably, I don't know, 150,000 people or so on. Uh, they're not used. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, uh, half of the stuff that's on there is kind of like freak shows. You know, people come in and they say, I want an hour, and then they do whatever they're thing is, you know. Uh, but uh, these are things that could be used. Uh, Somerville, which is right next door to Cambridge, uh, they ha it's been a little better used for community programs and for bringing in other things. There's a few other places, take around, around the Boston area, where it's used. Uh, ethnic communities sometimes use it uh, and so on. But, you know, there's a big resource, which is, is sitting there. You know, you don't have to do a thing. It's sitting there. It's publicly funded. Well, you know, privately funded, but under a requirement by the from the federal government. I mean, you, when you give away the ta cable channels, you're you're giving away public property to private corporations. And the original condition was that they do something for the community. So the thing that they did was put in these stations, but they're not being used. Uh, well, that's one thing. Uh, and uh, I happened to be in Brazil a couple of months ago, and there they have. Uh, very interesting public television. I think I, I think this may have come up in an interview that David Barsami and, and I had in Z a couple of months ago. I forget. Uh, but for example, they have uh, in uh, uh, Brazil. It's kind of the opposite of the United States. The slums are around the city, not in the middle of the city. 
I mean, they're also in the middle of the city, but most the standard style of you know European Latin American cities is the rich people live inside and the slums are outside. Uh, so when you go to the slums around Rio, there's you know millions and millions of people living in conditions that range from you know sort of survivable to hopeless. Uh, but there's huge numbers of people out there. Uh, they about I forget about ten years ago I guess one of the small NGOs in Rio uh, of uh, a couple of artists and television people and so on who live in town decided to try to set up a public television project out in the slums. And the idea is to, uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I went to see one, so this is after a lot of time. They, they went through a lot of interesting mistakes before they finally got it to work, <coughs> I'll tell you if you're interested. But anyway, what finally works and what they now do is, and I went with one, uh, is uh, they, they have a truck which has a big screen on top and has whatever equipment you need inside. But it's not a huge operation. It's all inside a little truck, little pickup truck, sort of. Uh, and uh, they go out to one of the sl one of these areas. It's all set up by the local people. They go out to a square. You know, this it's warm country. So everybody's outside. You know, and there's these like areas where people gather uh, or can. So they go out to a square. Truck goes in the middle. Screens goes up, and then they film uh, programs that are written by directed by, acted by people in the community, you know, so, and it's right in prime time television time. Uh, and lots and lots of people come out, they're all sitting around, you know, some of them are sitting in bars, I mean, some of them bring their kids, it's a sort of a nice atmosphere. And even though, not, even not knowing Portuguese, I could sort of figure out what it's about or people would help. I mean, this, the skits were about serious things. Uh, so there was one about racism, which was quite well done, kind of a little humor and some, but the point was there. Uh, another one was, one was about AIDS, uh, there was something about the debt crisis, uh, some of it was just entertainment, you know. And people were involved and interested in watching, uh, right after the, one, some series of these things, a young woman, maybe 17 or so, who was one of the actresses, lead actresses, uh, she was going around the crowd with a mic, just asking people if they had some reaction to it. You know, what, what do they think? And people would talk, and it would be uh, filmed right as they were talking. So you know, everybody else would be watching while the person sitting in a bar is commenting on what they just saw. And then it's a lot of interaction and so on. And it was lively and interesting and exciting. And you know, that's being done in a poor slum on peanuts. You know, uh, and it's it's quite a big thing. Goes on all the time. It took a long time before they sort of figured out how to do it so that it works. And what really worked is when the people in the community are doing everything. Uh, mean everything from, by now they've got people, mostly young people in the community who have learned how to do it. So they're now picking up the technical expertise. I mean, everything from the filming to the writing and to the directing and, you know, acting and so on. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And that's being done on real shoestrings in very poor areas. I mean, there's very few places in the United States that don't have a lot more resources than that. It takes some imagination and initiative. And they had a little money behind it from some NGO, but you know, nothing that you couldn't organize here without any trouble. You know, it's another possibility. There are lots of things that can be done. bit about your talks and your school that you went to. I was always curious what happened to that school and how important do you think it would be to set up a school like that again, or if it's even possible? Yeah, I think it'd be po In fact, there are schools like that, <coughs> what were called free schools. A lot of them were quite good. There's a guy now in Boston, Alan Graubard, who's been in, uh, uh, he was uh, at MIT back in the oh, six, back in he's back in Boston, yeah. On the days when Mike was making life difficult for everyone at MIT, Alan was around, young faculty member, very smart guy. Uh, he dropped, he, stu he you know, could have gone on, gotten tenure and all that sort of thing, but he dropped out and got involved in uh, the free school movement, which was just starting off then. And they did a lot of good things, uh, lots of independent schools all over the place. Uh, he, sta he stayed up, stayed on in the public school system. He's still an education activist. He's now back in the Boston area working on similar things. Sure, it can be done. I think it's a very important. On the other hand, uh, I should say, looking back at my own, ex I, I described my own experience 
But when I think back honestly of the other people who went through exactly the same experience, I don't think it had any detectable effect. So like, I don't know anybody else who was, a, say, a classmate of mine or in, who I knew who had anything like the same reaction to it. So I, I don't. I, it wasn't intended to be a radical place. It was just intended to be non-coercive and uh, constructive and you know free and not you know unhi non-hierarchical and so on. So it gave opportunities to do a lot of things. But exactly what effect that had on kids is hard to say. Uh, as far as I can tell, on most virtually none. Um, from what I remember of your readings, you said that um, one of the positions of mainstream media is that they're an the fifth point was that they're anti-communist. The last and of those filters. Yeah, the filters. That's right, the filters. So, with the Soviet Union down, what's mm. next? And is it China? I don't think so. I mean, actually, I should make it, you know, if you notice the title of that book, Ed, Ed Herman's name comes first. There's a reason for that. Uh, he ob objected strenuously. He wanted, we, usually when we write together, we just do it alphabetically. So, you know, C comes before H, so my name comes first. But I insisted this time that his name come first, and the reason is he did most of the work on the book. Uh, and uh, in particular, this part is his work, not mine. You know. I mean, I agreed to it, you know cooperated with it and so on, but it's basically his ideas. Uh, I felt that the anti-communist filter was the wrong thing. I mean, my feeling was that it was a temporary, it's temporary contingency, uh, and it's too narrow. And that now becomes clear, like a year after the book came out, the Berlin Wall fell, and uh, you've got to play some other game, not anti-communism. But in fact, that was going on right through the 80s. So by the time the Reagan administration, you know, from the early 80s, it was pretty clear that we're going to need something else as a mobilizing principle. And if you look back, when the Reagan administration came in, they came, it was like 1980, 81, uh, the big uh, slogan was, we're going to fight against international terrorism. That's the plague of the age, you know, not communism. Uh, then it became, uh, you know, crazed Arabs, uh, later, Hispanic narco traffickers. I mean, they're kind of flailing around for something. To, it's uh, there, there aren't a lot of different ways of uh, um, of mobilizing people. You know, making them obedient and passive. There are not many ways, and one of the ways is to get them frightened. So everybody hits on it. So everybody try, you always try to get the population frightened. Let them huddle in fear, and I'll protect you, and then they'll do what you say. So uh, the Russians were useful for that purposes. And they, you know, they're kind of frightening, rotten system, missiles, do awful things, so it's possible to frighten people. Uh, but that obviously wasn't going to be enough. And uh, they, uh, any, any power system is not going to want to give up the weapon of fear. So you have to frighten people of something else. So now it's clash of civilizations and you know, uh, the drug war. Uh, Actually, if you look at the campaigns during the 1980s, they were rather skillfully done. Most of them used race. Uh, Reagan won, it was either 80 or 84, I forget which one. Where do you have this uh, welfare mother story? 84. 84, yeah. You know, the black woman in the Cadillac uh, <coughs> coming for the welfare check and having millions of children because you pay for it, that line. Uh, he didn't say black, but everybody understood black woman, you know. So the welfare mother was, you know, it's not something you're quite afraid of, but you know, they're stealing from you. Uh, George Bush in the next campaign, 88, it was straight racist. That was the Willie Horton story. You know, the black criminal is out there raping your daughter and that sort of thing. Uh, they played it straight, you know, just a straight racist story. Uh, and those things had effects. I mean, they did change attitudes. So, uh, um, like the attack on the minuscule, actually the attack on the welfare system has been going on since the early 70s. A AFDC, the one that they just killed, uh, that had declined in value by about 50% from the early 70s till 1990. Uh, so it was going on all along. Uh, but now they finally managed to kill it with a lot of public support, I have to admit, uh, because of this story about how these welfare uh, mothers are stealing our money and it's even harming them, like they're getting into welfare dependency and that sort of thing. I mean, I don't have to 
pay its all a fraud, but uh, it worked. Uh, the uh, crime war is the same. Uh, uh, that was very successful. That goes back to the 60s. So it's not the end of communism, you know. It's the, in the late 60s, there was an effort started to get people frightened of crime. And f uh, f fear of crime has gone up. You look at polls, the fear of crime has gone up enormously, but crime hasn't. You know. So the level of crime is more or less stable. You know, you accommodate for faked FBI statistics. There's a number of, a lot of criminologists have pointed this out in the mainstream. Crime has not really changed very much. Uh, in fact, and the United States isn't off the spectrum either. Uh, so if you look at the industrial countries, uh, the United States is not the highest. It's toward, it's toward the high end, you know, because it has more poverty and, you know, more inequality and so on. Uh, but it's not, it's not like off the spectrum or even at the top, with one exception. The sole exception is uh, homicides with guns or suicides with guns. So k killings with guns, the United States is off the, you know, kind of like off the map. But that's because of the crazed gun culture. It's not because of the level of crime. So like in some other country where, you know, people get mad at a traffic accident and they beat each other up or something, uh, here they pull out a gun and kill each other, you know. So there's a lot of, uh, and there's a lot of suicides with guns too, or just accidental deaths with guns. But apart from that, uh, the, like in, say, rape or robbery or car theft or, you know, you run across the list, the United States is toward the high end but not off the, off the map. Uh, and it hasn't changed a lot. But fear of crime has gone way up. And it has been a device of mobilization. People really are terrified. I mean, if you look at the expenses for personal protection against crime, you know, crazy high-tech things on your house or your car or whatever it is, it's huge, you know, absolutely enormous. It has absolutely nothing to do with crime. In fact, according to the criminological literature, the police don't even listen to those things because about 99% of them are, uh, you know, something went off by accident or you know, something like that. Uh, so it's not protecting anybody, uh, but it's, uh, it's getting them frightened. You know, it's, uh, these are all techniques of frightening people. And when you're frightened, you accept authority. That's the idea. Um, I don't think China's gonna work. It's too far away and it's not frightening enough. Besides, American corporations don't like building up uh, China as an enemy because they make a lot of money there. Uh, China's, everybody talks about this terrific Chinese economy and how it's booming and so on and so forth. You know, gonna be the biggest exporter in the world and so on. Just take a look at the data. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, by now about 75% of Chinese exports are foreign controlled. And the uh, last figures I saw about 44% are totally foreign owned uh, that's going up very fast. Uh, two years ago, it was, I think, 28% foreign-owned. If you go back to 1980, it was about 1% foreign-owned. Uh, so what that means is, by now, three-quarters of Chinese exports are basically foreign corporations using cheap labor under horrendous conditions. I mean, the conditions of labor in that area of China that everybody's talking about how wonderful it is are absolutely out outrageous. Uh, it's mostly young women uh, who are, you know, brought in. Most of them have to get out by the time they're, say, 25 or something. They don't want them anymore, and they go back wherever they were. Uh, the, they're locked into factories. You know, the factories burned down. Uh, they had last year, the official figures for China were about 18,000 dead in just industrial accidents. Uh, the conditions are indescribable. But for foreign corporations, that's good stuff, you know. Uh, and the uh, Chinese controlled industry, their role is declining as the foreign owned increases. Uh, also, uh, quite apart from that, China probably there, I mean, there's tremendous unemployment in China and tremendous poverty. In fact, the number of unemployed people in China is probably higher than the population in the United States and going up. You know. uh, so uh, China is a a tremendous boon. There's a, there is a rich sector, and it's a big country, you know, like over a billion people. So the sector of people who are in the com consumer society is not small, which means there's substantial market, too. Uh, so for U.S. corporations or any foreign corporations, uh, China is a very valuable asset. You get extremely cheap labor under brutal conditions, because uh, it's a very brutal state. 
uh, and and, uh, uh, and it exports. You know, so it basically has nothing to do with the Chinese economy. It just you know, the inputs go in, the exports go out. Uh, a lot of money for corporations here, and it's a market you know, and a big one. And they're not going to let China be made an enemy. I don't think. It's my guess, at least. I'm interested in hearing your opinion about um, United States involvement and now disinvolvement with UNESCO and what implications and results you think that might have. UNESCO, specifically? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, what political statement you think the United States was trying to make, I mean, really make? Well, UNESCO was virtually killed about uh, 15 years ago. There's a really good book on this, if you uh, want details. It's uh, published, it's called Hope and Folly. Uh, the editors, it's a collection of articles. Ed Herman is one, uh, William Preston, uh, Herbert Schiller, I forget who else, I think maybe, at least the three of them, maybe somebody else. Uh, it was published by University of Minnesota Press. I don't think it ever got a single review. You know, it's a very good book. Uh, they they uh, went through the, the purposeful destruction of UNESCO by the United States because they really committed a crime. Uh, in the er, in the 70s, they tried to. There was an effort to construct what was called a new uh, new world information order or something. Uh, the fact is that international. You know, international information systems, like what's called information, you know, in quotes, uh, news and all that stuff, is highly concentrated in the very rich countries. Third world countries can't get into the act at all. You know, uh, and this was an effort to try to open things up. You know, to find a way to make more access for third world countries and what they call developing countries. That's the euphemism these days. They're mostly developing downwards, <laughs> but uh, let the developing countries to have a uh, some kind of share in communications, you know. Well, the United States went for Cirque, you know, and the news agencies and the news and the uh, uh, media went crazy. And they started a huge campaign about how these guys are trying to stop free speech. You know, it's these third world maniacs. They can't stand free speech and they're trying to stifle us and so on and so forth. It was all total lies, you know. The lies kept being exposed, but it didn't make any difference because the exposure of the lies never made it into the media here either. Uh, they go through the details of this. It's it's mind-boggling when you read it. Uh, but what happened? But it was extremely effective. It ended up with a campaign here to defund UNESCO, because these guys are totalitarians who are trying to deny free speech. You know, by trying to prevent our monopoly, the whole world. You know, that's how they're stopping free speech, and it worked. And the United States defunded UNESCO and essentially went out of business. It had to totally. Uh, it had to reconstruct, and the the reconstruction. The United States always hated UNESCO. And the reason is it's kind of oriented toward third world interests. And therefore, it's not an instrument of power. You know? uh, it had to modif they, they had to undergo what they called reform. You know, OK, reform means do what they tell you in Washington. Uh, and it pretty much changed, not totally, you know, but it changed in that respect. And now it's uh, barely, it barely functions in its original, uh, for its original purpose. The latest thing is to try to get rid of the UN altogether, I mean, to do the same thing to the whole UN. So just now, in fact, today it was announced the latest uh, US proposal for the United States is, uh, has not pay, doesn't pay its dues. I mean, if you're a big guy, you do what you like. You know, international law doesn't mean anything. Uh, the World Court doesn't mean anything. Nothing means anything because nobody can stop you. Okay, so the United States is the biggest thug on the block, so it does whatever it feels like. Uh, it hasn't paid dues for. Long years. It's illegal. You know, we have a treaty that says you got to pay dues, but you do what you feel like if you're strong enough. Uh, and the, um, you know, I think it's now over a billion dollars in arrears or something like that. Well, uh, the Clinton administration just announced yesterday or so that they would pay some portion of the, of what they legally owe. You know, big concession, uh, if the UN underwent reform. Okay, the reform means you know get rid of everything that we don't like. And uh, the United States is, uh, has a very, it, it, there's a massive lying about this in the press. But the fact of the matter, you know, it's all, everything you read is how the Russians blocked the United Nations. And, you know, now that the Russians are gone, we finally you do things. It's a total lie. Uh, from the 1960s, the United States is way in the lead in vetoing Security Council resolutions, uh, voting alone or with 
you know, Israel or Albania or somebody uh, against General Assembly resolutions, uh, blocking every initiative on every issue you can imagine, from human rights to international law to whatever. Uh, it's the U.S. is way ahead, Britain second, you know, France very distant third, Russia last. Uh, but uh, and the U.S. just turned against the United Nations, uh, and the reason is it got out of control. It got democ well, you know, it's not very democratic, but it got democratized, so-called. That is, other countries got in. In the early 50s, the United States, was ex the U.N. was very popular, uh, but that's because it did everything the United States said. If you think about the world situation then, the U.S. had all the wealth, all the power, all the food, everything else, uh, and the U.N. just went along. You know, the U.S. says something, the U.N. does it. So it was extremely popular. A lot of, you look back at the articles written by big shot intellectuals, it was all about how isn't this marvelous instrument of world order, you know, we finally have peace and so on. By the 1950s, uh, decolonization was beginning. And, the, and more countries were getting in, and that continued in the 60s. And that led to a non-aligned sector. You know, there was a big non-aligned sector of the third world countries that weren't part of e either of the major blocs. Uh, and they just uh, started doing things that the U.S. didn't like, so the U.S. turned against it. And by now it's almost alone. For about 20 years it's been virtually alone against the whole U.N. on issue after issue. So naturally, the thing to do is to get rid of it uh, or, you know, modify it so much that it's essentially subordinated to uh, U.S. interests the way it was back at the founding days. And that's what this new funding request, yesterday's funding request, aims to do. If you look at the papers today, you'll notice that uh, it's not just the third world that's angry about it, even Europe is quite annoyed at, what, at these U.S. proposals because it's a real power play uh, to try to turn the U.N. into a straight instrument of U.S. power. Uh, here it's talked about as, uh, in terms of reform. You know, they have too much bureaucracy and they waste money and so on, all of which is true, incidentally. Uh, but it's just as true of uh, any, you know, General Electric or, uh, you know, any local government you look at. Uh, but it's true. There's lots of guys riding around in the big cars who don't need them and, you know, got their girlfriends on the payroll and all that kind of stuff. Sure, that's all true. Uh, but uh, not beyond the norm, you know, for big institutions like that. Uh, I'm not sure I, if that was the thing that you were talking about, had in mind. It was, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the media and the Zapatistas? About? About the media and the EZLN, mm. Zapatistas and Shepard? Well, they've, uh, they have used the uh, internet very creatively and have tried very hard to build up international support and solidarity, which is very important. They wouldn't be alive if, it, if they hadn't done that. Uh, when the Zapatista revolution took place, I, my expectation, and I think everybody's expectation, was that the Mexican army, which is very brutal, uh, would just go in there and murder them, which they certainly have the force to do uh, with U.S. support if necessary, and that'd be the last thing we'd hear of the Zapatistas. Uh, they didn't. And the reason they didn't was because they managed to build up pretty quickly, use, and use, with a rather creative use of whatever media are around, like the Internet, uh, they managed to get their story out. You know, and it turned out they had plenty of support. So within Mexico, they had enormous support, uh, and internationally, there was a lot of solidarity. Uh, and the Mexican government, and probably the United States, realized that if they go in and kill them, Mexico is going to blow up. You know, so they backed off, uh, and they were given, you know, they're allowed to survive as long as they stay in the jungle there. Uh, then comes a period, then the next expectation is by the time people forget about them, the Mexico government will go in and do what it want to do in the first place, which I suspect is what will happen. But they have been trying to maintain visibility, both in Mexico and internationally, to protect themselves from that consequence, and so far they've managed. Uh, the Mexican government is going along with completely fraudulent negotiations, which they don't expect. You know, it's just a delaying tactic. 
Uh, they make an agreement and they don't keep it and drag it on and so on. And they're hoping, I think, that uh, sooner or later the world will get bored and the rest of Mexico will get bored and then they can win and use force. But so far, uh, that hasn't happened and it hasn't happened precisely because of, uh, of their ability to maintain international visibility. You'll notice that they keep calling conferences and they ask people to come down and they uh, try to set up relations in Mexico. That's uh, protection, self-protection. And it's had an effect and it's also influenced others. So other things have developed connected to the Zapatistas. But I, I don't know how long it can go on. You know, it's a little artificial at this point because the negotiations are getting nowhere. It's now pretty clear that they'll never go anywhere. Some strange things are happening. Uh, the Vatican, the bishop down there was pretty supportive and the Vatican didn't like him and put in another bishop who's supposed to be more reactionary. But this new bishop has somehow gotten involved and he's now saying, you know, pretty good things sure the Vatican is angry, but uh, now they got two bishops there who are more or less supportive, it seems. Which is, a, you know, it's important. I mean, that's the kind of elite protection. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit about the qualification of higher education? Yeah, that's, I mean, I th the people who are most worried about that are actually the scientists. Uh, the uh, uh, there, and there's a lot of protest and concern. Uh, I see it a lot at MIT, or you read the science journals, it's full of it. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, when the, I mean, the universities, of course, research is supported from the outside, obviously. Like, the universities don't sell their own products. By now, they're starting to do that, but not much. Uh, so, uh, up through the big growth period after the Second World War, it was, federal government funding overwhelmingly. Mo a lot of it Pentagon, you know, some of it National Science Foundation, uh, NASA, you know, Atomic Energy Commission, mostly sort of around the military system. Uh, and during that period, uh, uh, it was very free. So at MIT, which is super Pentagon University, there's just no interference from the Pentagon. You do whatever you feel like. Uh, because they understood that there was also no secrecy. They don't want any secrecy. Uh, the reason is that they more or less understood their role. Uh, their role is to be a funnel for passing public funds into private pockets. Okay, that's essentially the role of the Pentagon and the universities are part of it. MIT's, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, huge parts of it. Uh, they, they fund research and development. Uh, and then if anything works, you hand it over to private corporations. Like take say the internet, okay. The internet was, all the ideas came out of uh, uh, the military, the, the ARPA, the um, research agency in the Pentagon. It was implemented in the universities under military contracts. Uh, this includes the software, the hardware, you know, packaging, parallel processing, advanced microprocessor design. I mean, the whole business, all publicly funded. Uh, it was, uh, as long as that was going on, it was completely free and open, military funded for a long time. Finally, the NSF took it over. Uh, they've just, uh, a year or two ago, handed it over to private corporations, okay? Uh, they didn't see the point of it for a long time. You know, the big entrepreneurial geniuses like Bill Gates didn't see any point to the internet. Yeah, that's I mean, I th the people who are most worried about that are actually the scientists. Uh, the, uh, uh, there, and there's a lot of protest and concern. Uh, I see it a lot at MIT, or you read the science journals, it's full of it. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, when the, I mean, the universities, of course, research is supported from the outside, obviously. Like, the universities don't sell their own products. By now, they're starting to do that, but not much. Uh, so, uh, up through the big growth period after the Second World War, it was federal government funding overwhelmingly. Mo a lot of it Pentagon, you know, some of it National Science Foundation, uh, NASA, you know, Atomic Energy Commission, mostly sort of around the military system. Uh, and during that period, uh, uh, it was very free. So at MIT, which is super Pentagon University, there's just no interference 
from the Pentagon. You do whatever you feel like. Uh, because they understood that there was also no secrecy. They don't want any secrecy. Uh, the reason is that they more or less understood their role. Uh, their role is to be a funnel for passing public funds into private pockets. Okay, that's essentially the role of the Pentagon, and the universities are part of it. MIT's Stanford, Johns Hopkins, huge parts of it. Uh, they, they fund research and development. Uh, and then, if anything works, you hand it over to private corporations, like take, say, the Internet. Okay? The Internet was, all the ideas came out of uh, uh, the military, the, the ARPA, the um, research agency in the Pentagon. It was implemented in the universities under military contracts. Uh, this includes the software, the hardware, you know, packaging, parallel processing, advanced microprocessor design. I mean, the whole business, all publicly funded. Uh, it was, uh, as long as that was going on, it was completely free and open, military funded for a long time. Finally, the NSF took it over. Uh, they've just, uh, a year or two ago, handed it over to private corporations. Okay. Uh, they didn't see the point of it for a long time. You know, the big entrepreneurial geniuses like Bill Gates didn't see any point to the Internet. Uh, as recently as 1994, he was refusing to go to conferences on the Internet because he didn't see any money that he could make out of it. Finally, the light dawned, uh, and they realized they can take it over and make a mint out of it. So now it's handed over to private power. But the point is, as long as you have government funding, especially military funding, there's very few constraints. Uh, you can study what you want, do research on what you want. I mean, there's some, you know, they want to direct you to some things rather than others, but it's not, it's not enormous. Mostly it funded basic science and, ba and, and, and uh, not particularly applied engineering. Uh, Actually, the same was true. There's another technique of public funding which is less obvious, and that is by allowing a monopoly. So as long as AT&T was a monopoly in the telecommunications industry, they could raise, co raise uh, prices. You know, a monopoly can raise prices to whatever they want. Uh, raising prices is a tax, but then they could use that tax to carry out basic research. So uh, Bell, Bell Labs, which was there as long as AT&T had a monopoly, did fundamental research. And that's where they developed transistors and information theory and a lot of basic physics and cosm cosmology and so on. That's, again, public funding. It looks like it's a private corporation doing it, but they can do it only because they're a monopoly and they can tax the public. So it's basically another technique of public funding. As soon as the monopoly was broken, Bell Labs went out of existence. Okay because they couldn't tax the public anymore. Uh, the, uh, there's a move in the last couple of years away from federal funding and towards corporate funding. It's not too great. Uh, the reason it's not too great is because the ultra-reactionaries in Congress are trying to block it, because they understand, guys like Newt Gingrich understands, that you want to have federal funding because you don't want rich guys to pay the costs. You only want rich guys to make the profits. So you want to distribute, you want to socialize the costs. I mean, he understands that. So therefore, he wants to keep the NSF and NIH budgets high and the Pentagon research budget high. You notice that they're staying high. And it's the congressional so-called conservatives who are keeping them high because they understand the way the system works. You know. uh, but uh, there has been some change a shift towards corporate funding. And the shift towards corporate funding has exactly the effects you'd expect. Corporate funding is short term. They want a product, like if Merck Pharmaceutical funds a proje project in the Harvard Biology Labs, they want a product for them, not for their competitors, right? They want it short term, like you know they want it in a year or two years or something, not 20 years from now. And furthermore, they impose secrecy because they don't want anybody else to hear about it. Now, they can't formally impose secrecy, but they can effectively impose it by the threat of not refunding. So you get more, the effect of the shift to corporate funding is short-term projects, you know, very applied work, uh, cut back in basic science, increase in secrecy, uh, and uh, it harms the long-term profitability of the, you know, of private capital. So I suspect it's not going to go too far. But it's, in, it's kind of implicit in the shift to privatization. All of these things just follow along with it. And there's a lot of resistance to it. And in fact, uh, 
hasn't gone too far in those respects. Now, there's another kind of private of corporatization of the universities, which is also going on, but this is since the early 70s. Uh, that's in the humanities, mainly, in the social sciences and so on. There was a lot of concern that the, in the 60s that the universities were getting out of control. You know, just too much independence. Uh, and in the 70s, there was a counterattack. Uh, that's when the big foundation started coming along and, you know, the Olin professorships of this, that, and the other thing and a uh, big effort to try to just use the power of the purse, which is, you know, what those guys have, uh, to turn the universities, the universities back into conformity. And they mostly are concerned with the, the most concern is with the uh, kind of policy-related areas. Like they don't care that much about, you know, ancient history. A little, but not much. What they do care about is, say, economics or political science or something like that. And in those fields, it's very orthodox. Uh, like economics, for example, is really narrow. I mean, not much is tolerated. Uh, in uh, political science, maybe a little more. Uh, in the humanities, the same thing's going on. So you get people giving, you know, $20 million to have a program in um, great books, meaning you study what we tell you, you know, don't read this other stuff like women writers from the third world and all that kind of business. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. Uh, and that's, a, I don't know if you want to call it corporatization so much as uh, just private power wanting to ensure that the discipline is imposed. And that's visible. I mean, the universities actually, even the right-wing you know, elements don't like it much because they don't want to be dictated to by rich people. So, for example, Yale, if you notice, just turned down, finally, a big grant of, I don't know, $20 million or something, a lot of money uh, for some um, humanities program where the guy who uh, gave the money was insisting on having a role in appointment of professors. And that's just too much interference with private prerogatives, even for a pretty right-wing place, you know. So it's conflicted, you know. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's not that the universities were free before. They all, you know, their universities depend on, on wealth, you know. Like 95% of the population doesn't fund the universities. They get uh, its private wealth or else public money through taxes, you know, and that's uh, uh, like the Pentagon, that's public money. And it's, it's, uh, there was a big change in the 1950s, huge expansion of the public funding of universities through the, mostly through the military system and other related things like NSF and NIH, uh, and uh, that's so far maintaining. I mean, it ha the NIH and NSF budgets have not dropped, they're kind of stable even increasing slightly. I have a question about thinking. Think. About what? Um, about thinking. Thinking. Um, mm. It seems like, like in, order have, have, <laughs> <laughs> in order to have a, a for, for radicals uh, to pass on the institutional capacity to, to analyze critically and develop theory, there's a capability there that many of us have not developed or have developed with, you know, well, most people have got it knocked out of them. Right. I mean, children have it. So the question is, as radicals, as a group, as a movement, how do we uh, develop that, maintain it, and strengthen it, that capability? Well, you know, uh, um, I mean, I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, the, the, there's some tr kind of elementary things that can be said. For example, it's very hard to do alone. It takes a very weird person to be able to sit alone, you know, in the midst of a big propaganda system and say, I don't agree, you know. Uh, and if it, it, it's not just that you get, you know, st uh, stomped, but it's just hard, you know. On the other hand, when you do it collectively, it's a lot easier. If there are people, I mean, thinking, in fact, is collective. Like, take, say, science, you know. I mean, it's very rarely done by an individual. It's an interaction. If you're in a, say, a graduate science course at MIT, it's, uh, you know, the graduate students are talking, they're not, they're not copying, taking notes, you know, they're supposed to challenge and uh, think and tell the professor he's off the wall and so on and so forth. It's a cooperative activity. And that, the, and it's, it's just as much true in any other area. Uh, you think by 
trying out ideas and getting somebody's reaction and then telling you something and people bring in things you didn't know about and so on and so forth. Uh, so like, a, like you know, any kind of significant radical activity, it's going to have to be in organizations. And that develops thinking. Uh, there's no other, other than that, it's just, uh, you know, you figure it out for yourself. Nobody has any techniques. I mean, you have to be, keep an open mind, be skeptical, you know, ask for evidence when somebody comes up with a conclusion, that sort of thing. But, you know, it's all kind of, anything, that's, you know, either it's obvious or nobody knows. I mean, that's, uh, I think that's the general answer. Yeah. Primarily about the U.S. You're talking about the Philippines too. Is it not happening at a different rate and differently? In different countries. Talking about the whole world. I was talking mostly about the United States. Right. Uh, it's uh, there's some very. Uh, in fact, what's in the not true of the United States, as far as I know, is true of most of the industrial world. It's, it's different in different countries. I mean, ev even within the industrial world, it's there are differences. So the United States has a much freer high education system than other almost every other industrial country part of the reason for U.S. economic success. Uh, one of the good things about the United States is it had a mass education system. Uh, the, uh, the European countries did not. They had an elite education system. Uh, after the Second World War, they did open the universities up, but they didn't provide facilities. So in most of, you go to Italy, let's say, uh, everybody can go to you know, the University of Rome, except they haven't got any facilities for anybody. Okay. Uh, here, the system developed in a rather different way. The facilities developed along with the opening up. Okay, so a lot of people here can go to college, a large part of the population. It's less true elsewhere. Furthermore, the universities in Europe and in Japan, particularly, are very authoritarian. Uh, it's not so much true of England, but in continental Europe, uh, the universities are extremely authoritarian. I mean, a professor has enormous power and people have to conform. You know. uh, that's not just very lim true to a much less extent here. The universities are in fact much more democratic uh, for all kind of historical reasons, and that harms things. Uh, and there are other differences, but the, the move towards uh, you know, making education more vocational and more applied and more short term and more connected to corporate interests, uh, that's happening to some extent throughout the industrial world. Maybe less here than in places like Holland. Uh, in the third world, like, I don't know about the Philippines. I just don't know anything. But in, because I haven't been there, or, you know, I haven't followed it. But uh, various parts of the third, it just varies a lot. I mean, there's some places that are opening up. There's some that are, I don't think there's anything general. <coughs> not that I know. Like in parts of Southeast Asia, the technical education is growing very fast. So in, say, Malaysia and uh, Thailand, there's a lot more kind of engineering education than there was 20 years ago. Would that be to export um, highly skilled people? Like, or well, they don't want to export the people. The West would be happy to have them export the people because that's, one of, that's a way of getting other people. To, like, for example, the United States and... Europe are quite happy to get engineers or doctors trained in the Philippines or Malaysia and then they work here because that means those people pay the costs and we make the profit. In fact, there have been a lot of Philippine, Turkish and other doctors here, meaning the cost of the education is theirs but the benefits are here. So the immigration laws are almost every country are set up so that uh, trained, skilled people are allowed in. Unless they have a surplus and they don't want the competition, then they may stop it. But if there's like a shortage of doctors, you know, then you, let, you bring them in from the third world. Uh, so they don't, and those countries don't want to export their doctors. Actually, this is causing very complicated problems in a lot of places. I, I think I mentioned at least to some, some people that I was in South Africa a couple of weeks, about two weeks ago. Uh, and. Uh, one thing I was interested in was the role of Cuban doctors in South Africa. Uh, actually, I wrote about this in an article in Z a couple of weeks ago, but that was just from the newspapers. And I, I wanted to see it on the scene. 
you know, what do they think about the Cuban doctors? And it turns out to be quite complicated and interesting. Uh, there's a lot of opposition to the Cuban doctors on the part of the uh, certain sectors of the population, including the medical profession, but others too. Uh, uh, and, the, and on the other hand, in the rural areas where they go, there's apparently a lot of support for them because they're there. Uh, it turns out to be quite a complicated story. Under the apartheid regime, uh, they were bringing in doctors from the black African countries, like Ghana, say, and Kenya, and so on. So doctors from those countries were coming into South Africa, which is a rich country, and being sent off to the black rural areas. Okay. Now, the surrounding countries didn't like it because it's a brain drain. You know, like Ghana is training doctors, and they end up in South Africa. So for Ghana, it's a, it's a loss, you know. Uh, the uh, Mandela government, when it came in, uh, in order to stop this sort of robbery of the surrounding countries, uh, prevented doctors from coming from the surrounding black countries. So they stopped that arrangement, okay, as a, a gesture of solidarity toward the surrounding black countries. But of course, that meant there's now a shortage of doctors in South Africa. The white doctors don't want to go out and work and they want to, you know, live in Johannesburg and be rich. And the new black bourgeoisie has the same intention. They want to live in Cape Town and Johannesburg and so on and make money and be specialists. So what happens to the whole country? Well, the black doctors who were providing some services, uh, not cute, fantastic, but at least some services, they're now cut off as a gesture of solidarity to the surrounding countries. Uh, and Cuban doctors are coming in, but that make, leads to extremely complicated relations of, uh, you know, attitudes towards what's going on. Like, why should we? Why do we have to have Cuban doctors when we could have had black doctors, say, from Ghana? So there's that kind of feeling. And then the medical students don't like it because they're, you know, being undercut to a certain extent. So it's complex. That's one kind of brain drain problem. And you find other things in other third world countries. I was, I, last week, just a couple of days ago, I was in uh, uh, Israel and <coughs> Palestine. And there it's extremely tricky. Like they badly need doctors in the occupied territories. Uh, but uh, the medical system, which was, never, which was always bad, is collapsing totally. But uh, where are they going to get them from? Israeli doctors don't want to go. Um, Egyptian doctors refuse to go. They hate the Palestinians. Uh, the uh, Palestinian doctors, say, if they're trained in Israel, they now have a niche in Israeli society. So the uh, Israeli doctors tend to go into special. The Jewish Israeli doctors tend to go into specialties because they make a lot of money, you know, and that leaves an opening for general practice. And the oppressed section of the Israeli population, namely the Palestinians, they're using that opening. So they'll move into general practice at a lower, you know, much lower salaries, uh, uh, while the Jewish Israeli doctors go into private practice. But that also means they don't want to go off into the territories, where it's really tough work. You know, they're very poor and oppressed, and, you know, dungeons, basically. So there's a big problem. Uh, and uh, there are many other problems, but I, I don't think there's anything general that you can say about the third world. It's every place I've looked at; it's just different from place to place. Are the um, are the trends you've been speaking about in U.S. universities? Do you think they're responsible for a lot of what's coming out of the academic left, mainly postmodernism? Do you think? Um, that has a particular place in the doctrinal system, mainly people wanting to be subversive but not rock the boat, or do you think there's some other explanation for that? Well, you know, individuals have their own reasons, and you have to look and ask why they're doing things. But if you look at the phenomena as a whole, its effect has been, I think the effect is pretty clear. Uh, it allows people to take a very radical stance, you know, more radical than thou, but to be completely dissociated from anything that's happening. 
for many reasons. One reason is nobody can understand a word they're saying. <laughs> so they're already dissociated. It's kind of like a private lingo. And it's very, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, material reward that comes from it. Like if you're part of that system, you can run around the conferences and get big professorships and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of conventional material reward and it has this very radical look to it, so you feel, you know, every. Well, let me just give you an example. I, I gave a talk two, a couple of days, last Saturday, last Saturday, uh, at Birzeit University, you know, the Palestinian University at the West Bank. And it was, a, you know, you, like everywhere, big mass audience, political talk, mostly criticizing the Palestinian Authority, because I was in, you know, you always tell people what they don't want to hear, so I want to criticize Israel, I do it on the other side of the border. Uh, but, uh, the uh, and the, the audience, most of the audience, you know, very supportive, and they liked it and they understood it. The guys with the jackets and ties were pretty angry, but that's normal. Uh, however, as I left with an Arab friend of mine, who organized it, he's a, actually an Arab. Uh, he's an Israeli Arab who's a member of the Knesset, the parliament, but an old kind of good guy. Uh, he sort of la he was sitting in the back of the and he, he as we walked out he kind of laughed and he told me that he you know he said most of the especially younger people liked it a lot but he heard one critical really critical comment from a young woman faculty member uh, who uh, sort of liked the general political thrust of it but told him it was very naive and uh, he and I said you know why was it naive and he laughed and he said well it's because you uh, said that people do things on moral grounds and you talked about truth, okay? And that's old-fashioned nonsense. You know, that's kind of this old enlightenment stuff. We know perfectly well that nobody does it. I mean, I talked about how apartheid was overthrown, you know, and how it was necessary to have splits inside the white society, which there were. If the white society had been unified, they would have smashed the ANC. But there were splits from the inside and basically on moral grounds. People didn't want to tolerate it, and that was quite important, something you know, talked about that. Well, that's naive, because nobody does anything on moral grounds. So all power plays, you know, read Foucault and so on and so forth, if you can understand it. And truth is kind of like an old-fashioned concept, you know, there's no truth and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, that stuff goes on all over. I mean, uh, the, the next day I gave a talk at an Israeli university, um, and then it was critical of Israel and the United States and talk about the Palestinians. And there were commentators, and one of the commentators was the dean and, he, you know, he hated it, of course, and the uh, historian. And he said, he also said it was naive because I was talking as if there's, there's an objectivity in history. I was running through the history of what happened and saying how you should interpret what's going on now in those terms. It is complete naive. I mean, everybody knows there's no objectivity and there's no truth and it's this narrative and that narrative and so on and so forth. That's very convenient. It sounds very radical, you know, uh, and it's extremely convenient. You can beat people over the head with perfect, uh, you know, self-confidence because there's no reality anyway, uh, and it's just their narrative and your narrative. Uh, in the third world, it has it's particularly grotesque in my opinion. It's bad enough here. I don't like it here, or other rich countries. But when you get to third world countries, it's really grotesque because the, uh, you know, there the separation of the radical intelligentsia from popular struggle is a much more you know, it shows much more dramatically. I mean, people are much poorer and they're suffering much more. And these guys are usually pretty, pretty very rich, in fact, often. Uh, and it's ugly. But I think it has served a function. I don't want to say that the people who are involved in it necessarily do it for this reason. In fact, I know extremely good people who are very active and you know, I respect and like and so on who are right in this stuff. I don't know why, but. Uh, that means something to them. But as a general phenomenon, I think that's the way it's worked. It's worked as a way of insulating sectors of a kind of radical intelligentsia from popular movements and actual activism, uh, and, uh, serving as, and it served as an instrument of power. I, think, I suspect that's the reason why it's so readily tolerated in the universities. I mean, it's all over the place, in the third world as well. No, it's because of the function it serves. There are people who believe that uh, the programs of the right and the left make them diametrical opposites, <coughs> inherent enemies that goes on uh, forever. There are others who seem to feel that 
there's some possibility for communication between uh, the right and the left, uh, people like us and the militia and so on. Any thoughts on that? It depends a lot what you mean by the right and the left. So, for example, the Cato Institute is right. I don't mean that. Okay, but look, I mean, for a year, until before Z was founded, in fact, uh, the only journal in the country that I could write for was the journal of the Cato Institute, because we agreed on a lot of things. I mean, we disagreed fundamentally on basic things, but on, say, uh, state terrorism, uh, a lot of things in international affairs, uh, intervention, and so on and so forth, we agreed. Uh, so it was, and it was pretty open, so I could write things there. Uh, well, that's uh, right, left. If you look at the militia movements, I think they're a pretty complicated phenomenon. Um, like take somebody like Timothy McVeigh. You take a look at his background. You know. I mean, he's a guy who fought in the Gulf War. <coughs> I mean, who knows what experiences he went through? It wasn't very pretty, I'm sure. Uh, the uh, uh, his, he's somebody whose uh, life has come, uh, his, the community that he comes from, the sector of the population that he comes from, their lives have completely fallen apart. I mean, in the last 20 years, uh, uh, their incomes have declined sharply. Uh, their, uh, you know, their wives have to go out and work to put food on the table, which they don't like from the culture they come from, and you know, nobody would like people want to work fine but they're forced to work you know just to survive uh, the kids don't pay attention to him you know there's uh, the whole world of the way he perceived it is falling apart so you know you lash out uh, you lash out at the he didn't blow up a corporate headquarters notice you, bl you, you blow up a federal building because you've had it drilled into your head that the enemy is the government not because of the bad things the government does but because of the good things it does namely it supports uh, you know, it, it, has, it has some function. Part of its function is to serve the public interest. That's why it's attacked so much. Uh, but that's all he hears. You know, federal government is the bad guys, so let's go blow them up. Uh, well, that's kind of, you know, you have to understand that. It's not coming out of nowhere. Uh, these are parts of the population that back in the 1930s would have been organizing the CIO. Well, that option isn't open at the moment, so go to other ones. I, I think there's... Uh, in fact, if you go back to the union organizing days, it was bringing in sectors of the population that were very destructive before. If the, the if alternative options are open, same sectors can become very constructive. Uh, is that a bridge between the left and the right? Well, if you make it, you know. I mean, I think, I don't know, Timothy McVeigh, but I think people like that could be made to understand that their enemy is not the federal government. Their enemy is private power and the federal government, insofar as it's run by private power, which is most, most of it. Th there's been a kind of interesting shift in uh, just mass entertainment in this respect over the years. So I've been told, maybe you know better than me, but uh, you go back to the 1950s in, say, television, uh, the FBI was just, uh, you know, gods. Now I think the FBI is, uh, if you look at a standard cop show, the FBI is the bad guys. It's the local police who are the good guys, and the FBI is coming in and screwing everything up, you know, and they've got to get them out of their hair and so on and so forth. I understand that that's been quite a considerable shift. And if you think about the way the FBI was glorified back in the 50s, it's a pretty remarkable shift. Well, I suspect that that's part of the general propaganda of trying to make people hate the federal government but support the parts of the federal government that protect them from all kind of enemies and in fact funnel money to rich people. It's kind of nuanced, but uh, I think that's happening. And you see that in the mil militia movement. Let's attack uh, the federal government as the enemy because uh, uh, not private power. And of course, let's keep the Pentagon. You know. And they don't know that the NIH and the NSF are doing the same thing. Yeah, I want to ask how these, these propaganda things work. For example, we've watched wages go down, 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 down over a couple of decades, yet nobody thinks they're underpaid. They are overtaxed. And, you know, this is obviously a propaganda ploy, but yeah. who yeah, and how does this sort of thing? I mean, all of a sudden there's this big full-blown tax re revolt, but has, where did it come from and how? You know, look, I mean, you live here just as much as I do. Everything in the, everything that reaches people is you're overtaxed, 
you're giving the money away to these pointy-headed bureaucrats and these welfare mothers and these third world countries and so on, and you're suffering because you're paying too much taxes. That's all anybody hears. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's very hard when you're sitting alone and you hear nothing but this flood of stuff to say, wait a minute, uh, what, what, you know, maybe I'm not over, maybe we're undertaxed. See, it's interesting if you ask people, uh, you look at polls, the same people who say that they're overtaxed say they would like to have better, more money spent on education, on, uh, uh, tr on mass transportation, on preservation of the environment, actually even on welfare. If you don't call it welfare, because welfare has been demonized, but if you, if, if you have a, you take a look at a poll where they say, uh, should we uh, provide, should we guarantee uh, health and uh, you know, sub, uh, su sufficient food and decent living conditions for everybody? Yeah, most people say yes. If, if you call the same thing welfare, they say no. You know? uh, if you ask people to estimate how much of the federal budget goes to welfare, they give estimates which are kind of, you know, like off the map, way beyond anything that it is, like a third of the federal budget or something, that's a standard estimate. If you ask people how much money should go, they give estimates that are higher than the amount that does go. Same with foreign aid. You ask people uh, how much money should the United States spend in foreign aid, they give some, the, the standard um, answer is way higher than it is. If you ask people how much money do we give from, for foreign aid, they think it's way too high in order to be cut back. Well, you know, that's not that people are bad. You know, that's what they hear. What they hear is we're giving all our money away to these, uh, you know, third world people who are living in luxury and I'm working hard. Why should I give my money to them? Uh, on the other hand, if you say, well, should we give this amount of aid abroad? They say, yeah, sure, a lot more, in fact. Uh, so uh, where does the propaganda come from? Well, you know, he's See, every time you turn on the tube and every time you read the newspaper and every time you read the uh, journals of opinion and so on, it's constant. Mm -hmm. I mean, the United States is, in fact, under text. If, if you look at the, uh, at the actual facts, which are available, they're not hard to find, uh, the poverty level here is, the United States has the worst record among the industrial countries, bar none, uh, in things like child poverty, uh, hunger, you know, inequality, and so on. Every, just about every measure, it's the worst. If you want the latest figures, uh, UNESCO, which still barely exists, just came out with its 1997 report, which is just data, you know, just data on things like child poverty and mortality and so on for the countries of the world. It's just alphabetical. But if you look at the, the industrial countries, the United States is flat out the worst, okay? Um, now, uh, now, where does that come from? Okay, well, if you look at, in, at actual income, the United States is not the worst. So if you take, say, the, if, if you look at the distribution of income from, say, wages, uh, the United States is more or less like other countries. So how does it get to be the worst in child poverty and inequality? Well, because it's the worst in transfer payments. So for example, in France or Sweden or whatever, uh, the government intervention, which means the public intervention to, uh, uh, provide people's needs has a kind of progressive character, okay? So it shifts funding to some extent from the rich to the poor. In the United States, it doesn't. So if you look before transfer payments, the U.S. isn't off the, you know, redistribution, whatever government redistribution there is, like welfare and, st and stuff like that. Uh, if you look before that, the United States is sort of the norm. If you look after it, it's the worst. Well, that's because we're undertaxed. Uh, and not only undertaxed, but regressively taxed. I mean, every country is, but the U.S. is worse. And that disparity shows it quite strikingly. Uh, it's, the, it's that component of the system, the transfer payments, in which the United States is by far the worst. End result is we've got hunger, child poverty, you know, um, uh, starvation among the elderly, you know, all these things that other countries don't. And it's because we're undertaxed. But you know, how many people know this? I mean, how many people read uh, the you know biennial uh, report, State of Working America, which has all this data? Like you know, people we know. That's who reads it. 
Uh, Somebody's the, supposed to be reading that and yeah. then getting well, it. Well, I'm, I'm reading it. You can read it, you know. Yeah, but yeah. it's not going to go to the mass of the population. Okay, because in order to get to the general population, that see, like, I can read it because I, like, I'm a university professor, right? I got free time. I have resources. I've got money. You know, I have all these things that make it possible to do it. Suppose you and your, you know, suppose you have a couple who are working each 50 hours a week to put food on the table. They're not going to read this book. They don't even know it exists. You know, they couldn't even know that this data exists. They wouldn't know how to find it if it, if they, if, if somebody told them it did exist. I mean, they don't have, they're not part of that tiny privileged sector of the population which can do these things. Well, okay, that's what uh, radical organizations are for, to make it available to the general population. I mean, that's, look, uh, that's what a labor movement is for. A big part of the labor movement was always worker education. Like, when I was a kid, my, you know, my family was, mo was mostly first-generation immigrants who were working class. They knew all these things. Uh, a lot of them never went to school, you know, but they knew all of these things. In fact, knew them very well, you know, better than the people in the universities. Yeah, they were part of a lively, organized labor movement and political movement. Actually, the political movement was often the Communist Party back in those days. But whatever you think about it, it was a political, and I didn't like it, you know, but it was a political movement that brought people in and gave them a way to participate. Well, okay, uh, the labor movement, the political movements, and so on, they can make these things available. But so much of it is, is misinformation. Is somebody sitting out in a think tank saying, this week we'll demonize working mothers, and this, this weekend we'll attack daycare, and I will talk about divorce some more and say how awful that is, and the morals, of, you know, all, the, all this stuff. Why is the misinformation? Why is it there? there? Because the I misinformation is very much in the interests of people with privilege and power. Okay. So, and since they have the privilege and power and resources, why shouldn't they put it out? I mean, what do you expect them to do? Tell the truth? Why should they? First of all, objectivity is dead and truth is dead. And that's the objective truth. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe just the fact that Noam Chomsky is allowed to run around and talk and, and um, <laughs> that maybe that is proof of the power of these propaganda machines that, or the, the whole system that it can allow someone who's, who's saying your version of the truth to exist as they're still doing their own thing? Mm, um, well, what would be the alternative? We'll be winning when you're shot. No, I, don't, I don't understand exactly what, I mean, like who would, see, remember, this is, a, this, look, this is more or less, I mean, the, it's not a capitalist society. A capitalist society couldn't survive for three minutes. But if you look at the spectrum of world societies, this is toward the capitalist end. Okay, now, in a, in a real capitalist society, everything is a commodity. You know, everything's available. You get as much as you can buy, okay? And that's also true of freedom. Uh, and if you think about the United States, it's very free. I mean, the amount of freedom is very large compared with other societies. And you get as much as you can buy. Well, I can buy a lot. Okay. Uh, furthermore, other people from my same class background would not want the state to have the power to act against me. So if the state were to act against me, I would get supported by rich, powerful people because they don't want the state to have the power to act against people like them, namely me. Okay. <laughs> well, for ugly reasons, you get a lot of freedom. Uh, and actually, this covers quite a large part of the society. On the other hand, if you're a black organizer in the ghetto, you can get murdered. Because nobody cares whether the state has the power to go after them, you know. And they don't have uh, the resources to buy a lot of freedom. I mean, it's a very unequal class society. and. I suspect all of us, certainly me, benefit from that in the sense that we can buy a lot of privilege. That's why we're here, you know. How many people have the opportunity to spend some time in a place like this? You know, you've got to be part of a fairly privileged sector even to be part of it. Okay, and it, this is a rich country, super rich country, uh, by world standards, so an off a fair number of people are in this position, including working people, you know. Uh, but it doesn't mean that those are the only people who can organize. I mean, you, you, you go to, say, you know, really poor countries. Um, for example, take, say, India, a very poor country. 
uh, there's a, I was there about a, you know, about a year ago. There's one part of, Indi uh, uh, there's a provision in the Indian Constitution uh, that says, uh, that calls for village self-government. It says villages have to be allowed to, you know, have to have self-government. Formally, it's supposed to be every, most, it's a rural society, so this is, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, of course, it's never implemented. I mean, this is the villages are always run by landlords and gangsters and soldiers and so on. But there's two sectors of India where it works. Uh, one of them is Kerala, the other is West Bengal. Uh, a friend of mine who's an Indian agricultural economist, radical, took me through the West Bengal part. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, I was surprised. It is, it is really true. You know, you go to a village unannounced, you talk to the, you know, people get together, uh, you see who's running the village, there's a village committee. Uh, they've broken down caste distinctions and gender distinctions, which is no joke in rural India. So the village committee is half women, uh, all castes, you know, the head of it's a landless worker. Uh, one of the members of the village com committee in the, one of the villages we went to is a tribal woman. The tribal women are below anything, you know, I mean, the, even below the untouchables. Uh, so it's doubly, you know, low, namely women and also tribal. But she was right there sitting in the village committee. Uh, they answer questions. I've been in places where they're supposed to be collectives and cooperatives, like, say, Vietnam. And uh, when you go to the collectives, it's clear that they never worked. I mean, you start asking people in the village committee, you know, questions about the budget for next year. They don't even know what you're talking about, you know. Uh, on the other hand, which means that somebody else is running it. Uh, here they knew, you know. They could answer any questions you asked, the detailed answers, you know, took you, took you and showed you what they're doing. I mean, uh, went around. As we were walking through the place, we happened to, there was a building with some milk cans, so I asked somebody what it is. Uh, and they didn't know, but we went over and saw it, and uh, turned out it was a women's cooperative, milk cooperative, that village women had set up on their own, you know, uh, just, and not so much to make money, it's just to work together. In fact, they weren't making any more money than when they had their individual cows, but they were doing something together. Well, you know, when that, and you see things like, uh, there, there's, uh, when you go around, there's no water. Until very recently, they had no water. You know, you had to go somewhere and carry water on your shoulder. But now they have, uh, the water level is not very low, like it's about 30 feet, you can get water. Uh, there is primitive but functional technology, primitive pumps, that women, it's only for women. In fact, they showed us with considerable pride how they do it, took it apart, you know, stick it in and so on. And it, uh, they maintain it and run it. And that means that there's water for like a group of three or four families will have water. Uh, all of this stuff is in the last 10 or 15 years. These are very poor people, you know. But it's uh, relatively prosperous by Indian standards. Uh, how did they get it? Well, it turns out when you look back at the history, there was a very brutal guerrilla war fought, uh, you know, counterinsurgency war fought there in the 1970s under the Indira Gandhi government. I didn't even know about it. I'd sort of read about this stuff. Uh, but it turns out there was, uh, the government sent in troops, tried to destroy it. Uh, they were beaten off, you know. These guys fought and they won. You go past the house where the landlord lived, you know, the big fancy estate, there's nobody there. The landlord's gone, you know. Lands are divided up, um, run cooperatively. Okay, uh, you don't have to be rich and powerful to achieve things. In fact, quite the contrary. So there's a lot of opportunities all along the line, but people have to work. You know. It seems uh, one of the last huge corporations to still be under attack uh, from the government is the tobacco industry. And with a proposal of a 300 billion of 25 years, what do you think? Is well, I, a couple of years ago, I. Listen, somebody gave me a tape, an interesting tape of a talk given by a guy whose name, believe it or not, is Charles Whitebread, who's a <laughs> professor of, uh, he's a law professor at UCLA, and he's the leading specialist in the United States on the history of prohibition. Very conservative guy. This, he was giving a talk to the California Judges Association. That was quite an interesting talk, and I was sort of interested enough to re look back and read his articles. He has, you know, a big huge, a whole issue of the University of Virginia Law Review and a couple of books and so on. It's about the history of prohibition, especially the history of marijuana. Did very fascinating work on this. Very right-wing guy, you know, not, but it's very intriguing. Uh, one of the things he pointed out in this talk, it was about 10 years ago, he predicted that the government was going to make tobacco illegal. 
okay, to the California Judges Association, and he predicted it on the basis of the history. He said, look, if you look, you'll notice that uh, smoking is becoming class-related, mm -hmm. which it very strikingly is in the United States. It's a class issue. Like, you know, you, you get a graduate student at MIT. I haven't seen a student, a, an American student, smoke for probably 15 years. The only people who smoke at, are foreign students or, you know, some older people. On the other hand, if you go to the, uh, you know, junk food place where the teenage kids hang out, the poor kids, they're all smoking. They all have two cigarettes in their hands. It's becoming a class-related phenomenon. And what he pointed out is that the history of prohibition you know, ever since the early 19th century, has been that if some, if some behavior, some form of behavior is associated with, you know, what are called the dangerous classes, it gets prohibited, gets criminalized. Okay, so behavior that's associated with the poor and, you know, immigrants and bad guys, that tends to be criminalized. Uh, marijuana is a very striking example, in fact. Amer there's never been any medical, uh, when I read the his I thought, you know, I, when I read the detailed history, mostly his work, it's pretty interesting. <coughs> there has never been any medical testimony indicating that there's anything dangerous about marijuana. Uh, in fact, the American Medical Association and all those guys were against the prohibitions because they couldn't find any evidence for it. You know, there's nothing wrong with it as far as they knew. Probably not good for you, but nothing is. But it wasn't harmful. Uh, it was first criminalized when Mexican immigrants started coming in, Mexican workers. In fact, the first place to criminalize it were the places in the south, the states in the southwest. And they associated it with Mexican, uh, you know, the Mexicans were the ones doing it, and they're the dangerous classes, so we make it criminal. Uh, then it started spreading in the United States. In fact, the peak of marijuana use was in the late 70s. But there was very little criminalization. You know, not, like not a lot of people were sent to jail for smoking marijuana. The reason, uh, it was rich white people. You know, it was, uh, you know, kids and students and fancy universities. You don't send those guys to jail. So the level of criminalization was actually low, though the level of usage was peaked. Uh, in the 1980s, that began to change. There was a sh uh, in the 1980s, there was a decline in the use of any kind of substance among educated people. And by that, I mean everything from tobacco to drugs to red meat, you know, to coffee. I mean, all of this stuff started to decline more or less steadily among educated, more wealthy people. On the other hand, it remained stable in the poorer sectors or even increased. Okay, at that point, that's exactly when the criminalization started, when you were going to get, it was going to be a war against poor black people mainly. That's when criminalization started, okay? Uh, I mean, it was technically illegal, but the laws weren't applied until then. That's when the war on drugs began. In fact, it was pointed out at the time that this is just a war against the poor. You just look at the trend lines, you can see exactly who's going to go to jail. You know. uh, well, now what about tobacco? He pointed out that the same thing is happening with tobacco now. It's becoming class-related. Uh, and as it becomes class-related, it's going to probably get criminalized. That's the standard. Actually, prohibition in the United States was sort of the same. Prohibition was not aimed against, uh, you know, rich people up in upper New York State. They kept drinking as much as they liked. The point was to close the saloons in New York City because that's where poor working class immigrants are getting together and those guys have to be stopped, you know. Uh, and that's pretty much the way it worked. In fact, it's, sometimes it's astonishing. Like in Britain in the 19th century, <coughs> for about 20 years, they criminalized gin but not whiskey. <laughs> well, it turns out gin is what poor people were drinking and whiskey was what rich people were drinking, you know. So anyhow, he predicted tobacco will be criminalized, and I think that's now what we're seeing. Uh, it's, it's becoming a behavior pattern of the poor, and behavior patterns of the poor call for uh, criminal act, for punishment. I don't know what the behavior is. And furthermore, let me, one more word. He, he noted, and if you look at it, it's true, that the tobacco companies were expecting it. They were diversifying. So now the, I mean, the tobacco companies make a huge amount of money, like Philip Morris, one of the top corporations, but take a look at where their income comes from. It's not so much coming from sale of cigarettes in the United States. It's sale of cigarettes abroad and sale of things like cereals in the United States and other things. They're, they're now a conglomerate, you know. They sell all kind of things. 
and the tobacco sales are oriented more and more towards the third world, uh, where they can use the force of the U.S. government to open up the markets. So like there's a threat to countries abroad that unless they open their markets to U.S. poisons and advertising aimed mainly at women and children will close the U.S. market to them. <coughs> That's a strong <coughs> weapon. Uh, so that, so they are, ex and his prediction, he's probably right, is they're expecting criminalization. You don't think that the country has their hands in the politicians' pockets? Yeah, but people? you know, they've got other ways of making money. Yeah. I mean, it's, they cannot deal, they cannot change the fact that it's, that smoking's becoming a class-related issue. That's just a phenomenon. And one of the effects of tobacco use being class-related is that there's a likelihood of criminalizing the behavior, or at least penalizing the behavior, because it's poor people and working people and so on. So you want to penalize it and maybe even criminalize it. And they've been looking at that and are diversifying into other products and also aiming at the third world. So sure, they've got their, you know, they, yeah, they're one of the biggest funders. Philip Morris is one of the biggest fun political funders. And they, you know, they're going to hold on to what they can, but I think they probably see the right handwriting on the wall and don't care that much. What you was know? the name of that book? Uh, the book is by B-O-N-N-I, B-O-N-N-I-E, Bonnie is one, the first author. He's also a law professor and white bread. And it's called uh, The Marijuana Connection or something like that. They spell marijuana with an H. Uh, it's a hard book to get, but it's around. I got it on interlibrary loan from some university around here. And it's a s sort of history of the criminalization of marijuana and other things. It's quite, a, quite an interesting study. There, there's another one that just came out, which I haven't read yet, which probably covers much of the same ground. It's by a guy named Lester Grinspoon, G-R-I-N-S-P-O-O-N. He's a... Uh, medical researcher, a pretty well-known one, who's been fighting for legalization of marijuana for many years. He's a New York physician, I think, and I forget the title, but it's, it's uh, just flipping through it, which is all I did, it seems to cover some of the same ground. Uh, go on for a yeah. But uh, it's an interesting topic. Yeah. You guys want to take a break? Sir? You want to take a break? All right, let's take a break for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oops. I got to take. International financial system in the early 70s. The, the, after the Second World War, there was an arrangement. You know, the Bretton Woods system was established, which. Uh, basically made the United States the world's banker. Remember, the United States was, had, you know, was super rich at the time. It, it practically had half the world's wealth, for example. Everybody else had been smashed. The US, the US gained enormously during the Second World War. Industrial production more than tripled, and everybody else was smashed. The United States was way ahead before the war started. So it was really in a position to run the world uh, like nobody in history. Uh, and part of that system was an international financial system which uh, in which the dollar was linked to gold, had a fixed price in terms of gold, you know, so it was kind of like a gold standard, except it was a dollar standard. And every other currency was linked to the dollar. And then the IMF uh, had a complicated set of re regulations which allowed some, you know, controlled shifting in relative currencies depending on specific economic situations in particular countries. But that, it was a very regulated international financial system based on the dollar, which meant the United States was in effect the world's banker. So if more money is needed, you pick up <coughs> dollars. Uh, by the early 1970s, it was getting hard to sustain that system. Uh, Europe had recovered from the war. Japan had, to everyone's surprise, become a major industrial center. Uh, and the, it was kind of like a, what they called a tripolar economy, you know, three centers, Germany, Japan, German-based Europe, Japan, the United States. The United States is still way ahead, but anyway, it was more diffuse. So, for example, in uh, 1950, the United States had half the world's wealth. In 1970, it was about a quarter, which is still a lot, you know, but it's not half. Uh, anyhow, um, and then the Vietnam War came along which was extremely beneficial to Europe and Japan and even places like South Korea. It was a big shot in the arm for them. Uh, and it was harmful to the U.S. economy. Actually, the harm to the U.S. economy is the main achieve. I think, the main achievement of the anti-war movement. The anti-war movement uh, 
produced enough internal turmoil so that the government could never declare a national mobilization. If there had been a national mobilization, like during the Second World War, uh, it probably would have worked as it did in the Second World War, very beneficial to the economy. It also would have smashed Vietnam totally. Uh, but uh, they couldn't, so they had to run a, what was called a bun uh, guns and butter type war, you know, sort of keep the population quiet because everybody there was so much opposition. And that's harmful to the economy. It caused uh, stagflation, you know, stagnation and inflation, which was uncontrollable. Uh, so there were internal economic problems. Uh, Euro the rivals, Europe and Japan, gained. The U.S. was in some difficulty. Uh, probably the system was unsustainable anyway. And in, the, and in 1971, uh, Nixon just uh, dismantled it. Again, that's the, one of the prerogatives of power is if you don't like the international treaties and arrangements, just dismantle them. Uh, so uh, in violation of GATT and everything else, uh, Nixon simply dismantled the international trading system and also imposed uh, import duties, which is also illegal, uh, to block imports from elsewhere and you know, wage constraints and a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, that uh, actually was in accord with what a lot of economists were, were recommending because it opened up international financial exchanges to free markets, which is supposed to be a great thing. You know? And Milton Friedman was predicting that it's going to stabilize currencies and everything will go to the market value and so on. Had a totally, like almost every prediction of professional economists came out the opposite. You know? uh, it turned into a wildly chaotic international economy, huge ups and downs, you know, the whole thing was blowing up. No, and then it turned into what uh, a lot, some international economists, Susan Strange, very good international economists, call a casino economy pretty conservative international economist in London. So it's like a casino, you know, you know, goes out of control all the time, nobody knows what's happening and so on. But one effect was a huge uh, expansion of uh, short-term uh, speculative capital flows. So a huge amount of money started being spent just in short-term transactions. Uh, just to give you some numbers, in <coughs> 1970, about 90% of the capital in international exchanges was related to the real economy, either investment or trade, 10% speculation. By 1990, the figures had reversed. By 1995, according to UNCTAD at least, it's about 95% speculative. Uh, and it's a huge amount. I mean, it just exploded. It's now supposedly over a trillion dollars a day moving up and back between financial markets. Uh, and that just completely overwhelms the currency reserves of even the rich countries, like the United States or the European Union. Their total currency reserves don't come close to that. Uh, and that means that this, and what does that international capital do? Uh, also, it's very short term. Like about 80% of it has a turnaround time, meaning you, know, you invest and it comes back uh, of under a week. And most of it uh, is a, under a day and a lot of it is within a couple hours. So it's just really moving very, very fast. And what it's looking for is uh, high interest rates and low growth. So if, a, if some country tries to stimulate its economy, like if, if President Clinton, suppose he gives a talk in which he says, uh, he makes some hint that he might do something to stimulate the economy or social spending or something, just a hint. Okay, the, there's three news agencies now, AP, Knight Ritter, and uh, Reuters. Reuters, yeah. And Reuters is in fact the biggest, believe it or not. Uh, the three of them, they, they do very little news reporting. They mostly do financial reporting. Uh, every, you ask, a, say, a Reuters correspondent <coughs> what they do, they have a mobile phone, you know. They go to the talk. Uh, and if Clinton, if they hear some word that says, you know, maybe we'll do something to stimulate the economy or increase social spending, everybody runs out uh, on, on their mobile phone. They call some central database and they say, Clinton said so-and-so, you know, and comes back verifying Clinton said so-and-so. And they say, yeah. And then it immediately goes out to all the markets over the world because that's what their audience is, you know, speculators, financial markets. And they say, you know, Clinton indicates stimulation of American economy. Everybody sends their money somewhere else, you know. And that's like a trillion dollars suddenly moves from one market to another because they're moving away from growing economies. They don't want that because that, uh, you know, 
might lead to inflation and cut down the value of money and so on and so forth. Well, the effect of this, and it was understood a long time ago, it was understood right away, you know, early 70s, that this is going to be a, that this f fast speculation is going to drive the world, the global economy, into kind of a low wage, uh, low growth equilibrium, also high profit for financial institutions especially. And that's pretty much what happened. That's the, this is a, uh, there were other things that influenced it too, like the development of you know, telecommunications came along at the same time. The big growth in telecommunications came along at the same time. And that makes it very easy to do things like this, a lot easier. So for example, the whole, you know, Tokyo is the opposite time zone from us, more or less. So like you can get the whole of the New York stock market over to the Tokyo stock market uh, within few seconds, you know, and that means you can exploit, you can keep it working 24 hours a day, basically, the money. And that's how guys like George Soros and those characters, you know, get super rich by playing little games with, uh, spec with currency speculation and so on. It has a terrible effect on the economy. It's just drawing money away from productive investment, uh, and it's uh, also uh, attacking growth. It's attacking growth and it's attacking uh, benefits. Uh, and it puts government sort of in hostage. Well, can it be controlled? Yeah, of course it can be controlled. In fact, it's, it's like it's not out, you know, it's not like some act of, you know, like an act of God or, you know, a law of nature. In fact, proposals to control it were made right away by very mainstream economists. Uh, James Tobin was the first. He gave a talk at the American presidential address at the American Economics Association in which he pointed out what a lot of people were thinking, that if you put a small tax on short-term speculative transactions, like, you know, in a day, that'll slow, them, that'll slow it down, put sand in the gears, you know, because it'll be a little more expensive, so it'll slow it down and there'll be more money transferred over to productive investment and so on. Uh, there's a lot of technical debate about whether you should do it that way or some other way and so on. If you're, if you're really interested, there's a book that just came out called The Tobin Tax. This thing is called The Tobin Tax. Uh, in which a lot of you know World Bank economists and hotshots and so on have technical articles on whether it would work and whether you should do it this way or whether you should do it that way and so on. But the general consensus is probably something like that would work. There's a lot of similar proposals. Uh, well, you never know whether these things are going to work until you try them because nobody really understands the economy. You know, it's mostly kind of like a mystery. Uh, but the proposals could work and they could be tried. They aren't tried because the financial institutions like it. Uh, furthermore, even the, it's in, an interesting fact which has been discussed is that uh, even though the manufacturing sector of the economy is harmed by this, you know, because the money's going away from manufacturing towards financial institutions, they're still supporting it. And the reason they're supporting it probably, I'm, I'm quoting actually David Felix, who's a good international economist who's written about this, he suspects that the reason they're supporting it is because it's a terrific weapon against social spending. Uh, if any country does carry out social spending, this weapon blocks it. So say, uh, you know, like GM, which would like to have more money going into manufacturing rather than financial speculation, nevertheless approves of this because it's a weapon against social spending and against the labor movement and so on. So the sort of secondary effects that make it worthwhile. That's had a big effect on the international economy. It's probably one of the major reasons for the, uh, maybe the major reason for this steady decline in, uh, say, wages and income for most of the population that's been st either stagnation or decline. It's been going on for around 20 years. Sharper in the United States than other places, but you know, this similar phenomena in other countries. This is worse, but England and the United States are the worst, I guess, but uh, similar in other industrial countries. Uh, well, it's controllable, but you know, it's happening. Uh, that was a big change. Um, the end of the Cold War also had an effect. I don't think it had a major effect, but one effect that it had was, uh, I mean, that. Eastern Europe was the original third world. You know. It kind of pulled out of the third world during the communist period, which a monstrous period, but it did develop the society. So it became an industrial society. You know, it's not third world. Uh, and it had industrial level health standards and educational standards, and you know, it wasn't as rich as the first world, but it was basically an industrial society. Uh, that changed in 1989. 
Now it's going right back to the third world. And it's kind of interesting, speaking of the media, to see how they handle this. Uh, there was an article in, front page article in the New York Times a couple of days ago, maybe the Sunday edition, you know, by their, one of their big thinkers on Eastern Europe, his name is Michael Spector. It was called uh, Dr. Dostoevsky's you know, analysis or something. And he was talking about why the Soviet Union has completely collapsed, you know, like about half a million extra people are dying a year, you know, since 1989. Uh, life expectancy has dropped very sharply, particularly for males. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, ho the whole place is in total, totally destroyed. In fact, you know, it looks like it's being destroyed because it's beginning to look more like the third world than it did. It doesn't look very different from Brazil. In fact, it turns out it's now at about the level of Brazil. Okay, which, uh, well, why did this happen? Uh, it, one possibility is because market reforms were introduced in 1989. No, but that, you could, you're not allowed to think that. So in fact, the word market never enters, never appears in the article. So it's all about the Dr. Dostoevsky's analysis. Dostoevsky wrote something about the Russian soul, you know, and there's something about the Russian soul that's different. I mean, and you really have to read it. It's like a comic strip. Uh, because it's perfectly obvious what's happening. They introduced market reform, so yeah, of course, sure, the whole thing's looking like the th rest of the third world, you know. Uh, but uh, no, it's got to be the, the Russian soul has never been able to do this and that. I mean, okay, so that's Do Dr. Dostoevsky's uh, analysis. Somehow the Russian soul wasn't operating before November 1989, <laughs> and then it suddenly started operating. Uh, but uh, I mean, you really have to have a good education to be able to handle this kind of stuff. <laughs> but. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that was change for Eastern Europe, but of course that had an effect. Now that it's part of the third world again, it means that you get very cheap labor, you know, uh, right across the border. So like a German factory, say, can Daimler-Benz or somebody, they can invest in, say, Poland, you know, or Russia or some place where they get educated workers. It, it's not going to be true down the road, but for the moment they're still getting relatively healthy, educated workers, you know, even white, uh, at a 10% the cost of the Western European, what the press calls the pampered Western European workers. That's what the business press calls them. You get them at 10% the cost of the pampered European workers. They don't have any benefits. If they get out of line, the state comes in and smashes their heads in. It's a big improvement, and it's a way of uh, attacking, it's kind of like northern Mexico for us, you know. And in fact, American like GM and those guys, they invest there too, same reason. Uh, well, that's an attack on living standards for Western workers and is recognized as such. I mean, it's all over the business press, you know, like they're very frank about it. Uh, uh, business Week, Financial Times and so on understood that what this means is another weapon against uh, the pampered Western workers and their luxurious lifestyle, as they say. So that's a change. Uh, and, of course, the um, collapse of the Soviet Union meant that the Soviet Union, whatever you think about it, it was a big military force. So it was a deterrent. It means there's a limit on what the U.S. can do because maybe you get in trouble. Uh, well, with the Soviet Union gone, it frees up the deterrent. It eliminates the deterrent. It means it's much freer to act. Uh, the U.S. and Britain would never have put half a million troops in the desert uh, in Iraq if the Russians were still around. It would have been way too dangerous. But with the Russians gone, they can do anything they want. You know, uh, even the invasion of Panama, uh, you know, it's a little operation. I mean, it's kind of like, stand, you know, footnote to history sort of. But uh, Elliot Abrams, the Undersecretary of State, did point out correctly that uh, this was different from earlier U.S. interventions uh, because there was no need for any concern about a Russian reaction anywhere. So you're kind of freer to invade other countries and stuff. Uh, so there's small, you know, there's change, tactical changes, but I think the big change is just that this region's been reincorporated into the world system as a service area. Um, you know, cheap labor, a lot of resources can be robbed, uh, you know, all this, it, and it has rich resources and it's a big place. So that's change. Uh, now, of course, it's, it's, it's not a homogeneous area. So there were parts of Eastern Europe that had been parts of the first world, like Czechoslovakia. You know, it was a rich industrial country. So it's kind of moving back to what it was. It'll be, at least the Czech Republic will be part of the industrial West. The Western Poland was really part of Germany, more or less. So it'll become part of it again. Same with parts of Hungary and so on. But most of the region is, in fact, the whole region is going back to what it was. You know, it's more or less what's happening. And that has an effect on uh, 
on the international economy and on, say, uh, Western workers, because they, there's other ways of smashing them over the head. Uh, these are uh, useful things. I mean, like take, uh, or take, say, the trade agreements. Uh, the trade agreements are, they don't have much of an effect on trade, but they, in fact, if you look at NAFTA, it really hasn't changed. Everyone talks about how trade has increased between Mexico and the United States since NAFTA, which is true, but meaningless. Because if you look at the trend line, trade was growing between the United States and Mexico just normally, and if you, it didn't change in 1993. It's still growing at about the same rate. Actually, it slowed down a little bit if you look. But yeah, it's growing, but just continuation of what was before. However, uh, the trade agreements have a very important effect. They are a big attack on democracy, and that's what they're intended to do. They, a, a treaty is very hard to get out of, you know. Uh, and the trade agreements, as to use the terminology, they lock the countries into the economic reforms. Okay, so the trade agreements impose certain obligations by treaty, and countries like Mexico are locked in. Uh, that's a protection against what's called the threat of a democracy opening. I'm not making this up, I'm quoting, you know, the threat of a democracy opening in Mexico that might challenge the United States on, you say, nationalist grounds or something. That's blocked by a treaty that locks them into the reforms. Uh, it also offers a threat against American workers, North American workers, you know, like the United States and Canada. Uh, they can, if, uh, I don't know if you saw this study, this suppressed Labor Department study that's been leaked out here and there by Kate Bronfenbrenner of Cornell, you see that? Uh, there's, uh, uh, the, under NAFTA, there's kind of a range, you know, to try to get NAFTA through, they put in side provisions that pr allegedly protect labor rights and so on. Of course, it's a fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they're there, you know. So they have to do things like carry out studies. And they did carry out a study uh, done by the, uh, Kate Bronfenbrenner, a labor economist at Cornell, good, well known and good one. She ran a study in which she was studying the effect of NAFTA on uh, strike breaking in the United States. Because the labor movement claimed you know, that it's being used, that the threat of trans, the transfer of plants is being used to break strikes. So, According to the NAFTA regulations, they had to do a study. She ran the study. She found some pretty dramatic things. Uh, she found, but the Labor Department's depress, suppressing it. They won't let it come out. It's kind of leaked, so it's appeared here. Bits of, it's appeared here and there. Uh, the uh, turns out that about half the organizing efforts in the United States are broken simply by the threat of transfer, and that's tripled since NAFTA. Threat of transfer. Okay. Uh, in other words, you know, you try to organize a plant and they put up big signs outside saying, okay, your job's going to Mexico and that kind of stuff, you know, it tends to break the strike. It's illegal, uh, but the Reagan administration had made it quite clear to corporations that it wasn't going to enforce the law. And uh, Bush and Clinton have continued that. So you've got a criminal state behind you, you can carry out illegal activities. And that's being used to discipline and control the labor movement. That's another reason why things are going down. That's you know, the kind of thing the trade agreements are for. It locks countries into these reforms, so-called, you know, which essentially transfers power over to transnational corporations, and it makes it very hard for them to get out of it. Uh, there's another one coming along down the road, which is very serious. And you know this multilateral agreement on investors? Have you have I talked about that? Yeah. OK, that's cool. Hmm? You, be, you know about that stuff? No? Uh, well, there's. Uh, there's actually two, they're actually the same treaty, but they have two different names. One is called Multilateral Agreement on Investors, the other, the other one, the Multilateral Investors Agreement, the same thing. <laughs> uh, one of them's going through the World Trade Organization, the other's going through the OECD. Uh, the World Trade Organization is having some problems. Uh, well, let me just tell you what it is. It's, uh, it's, it's like if you were, you know, if you were uh, an executive of General Electric, and you were asked to write the perfect agreement that would maximize profit and power and maximally destroy democracy, this is it. You know, It has every provision you can imagine. It gives free right. The drafts, of, the drafts are sort of secret, but they've leaked. Actually, I read one. Uh, and uh, they, it's unimaginable. You know, like it gives investors the right to do anything they feel like. You can move uh, funds freely. You can move factories freely. No constraints, so you don't have to worry about minority rights, about uh, technology transfer, environmental conditions, uh, going to special areas, you know, where you want to have development. I mean, anything that any population might want is excluded, 
and it's pure investor right, okay? Uh, it's, uh, it allows corporations to sue governments from local governments up to the federal government. Like if the city of Boston, you know, imposes some condition on, you know, hiring women or uh, not polluting the environment, corporations can sue them, but it doesn't allow reciprocal rights. So it means no population can sue a corporation. I mean, it's, it's like a complete, it's, it virtually dismantles whatever there is of a democratic process and hands it over to private capital. Uh, well, technically, I mean, it's, you know, it's not supposedly secret. I mean, like it's not uh, inside the National Security Council or something, but nobody knows about it. It was supposed to go through in May 1997, but it was delayed, and now they're aiming for May 1998. Uh, in the World Trade Organization, it's being blocked. And the reason is that countries like India and Malaysia and others are making a, are screaming about it. Uh, because it basically turns them into wholly owned subsidiaries of foreign corporations, and they don't want that. And they have enough clout in the WTO to block it. But in the OECD, it'll probably go through. You know, that's the rich countries. So there it'll probably go through because their corporations will gain by it. Their people will lose, but that's not what they're for. Uh, and if it goes through the OECD, the other countries are forced to accept it uh, because of the, of the threat of closing markets which is lethal, you know. So that means if it manages to get through the OECD, it's a world treaty. Uh, how can it get through the OECD? Well, only if people in the rich countries don't know about it. Because if they do know about it, they're going to scream bloody murder and they'll block it. So it'll probably go through in secret. I mean, not technically in secret, but without the idea is to get it through without anybody noticing, you know, like the World Telecommunications Agreement, and like, like they hope to do with NAFTA. It was intended to go through quietly. Uh, and it'll be coming up this fall or, you know, so it's a big issue, you know, a major issue. Well, that'll have a big effect on the global economy. I mean, all of these things are, are moving in the same direction. I mean, it's called free trade. It's nothing to do with free trade. It's turning, tr trying to transfer decisions into the hands of unaccountable private tyrannies. That's what it's actually about. This is very little to do with, I mean, it's not free trade in any meaningful sense at all. Uh, so like take say, uh, I mean, it takes say, th the biggest item traded in international markets is actually aircraft. Uh, I mean, aside from oil. I mean, oil is the biggest, but you know, nobody thinks that that's free trade. I mean, that's managed trade completely. Uh, so nobody even pretends. Uh, aircraft is like the biggest civilian export here. Uh, and for the big countries, huge market. Uh, well, it's now in the hands of two companies. Boeing, McDonnell has a monopoly in the United States. Airbus has a monopoly in Europe. That's it. That's world trade and uh, civilian uh, aircraft. And they're both government subsidized. You know, neither, neither of them is a private corporation, just the profits are private. Uh, that's aircraft. You take a look at telecommunications, more or less the same. I mean, the whole thing is like a, you know, this is an economist scam. Uh, if the economics profession were not so tightly disciplined, there'd be a lot of talk about this, but, you know, nothing happens. Uh, well, you know, these are all changes. I mean, these are big changes over the last uh, 25 years. Um, I don't think there's any reason to think that they're uncontrollable. Like the financial market, the biggest change is probably in the financial, you know, financial capital flows, which looks as if it's controllable, at least you know, pretty good economists have suggested ways that they think would control it. It's a matter of decision. Uh, when you talk about the globalization, uh, first of all, a lot of that is fraud. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War, that was the period that was different. Look over the last couple of centuries, and you look at, say, the level of globalization of the economy, like the amount of trade or investment and, and that kind of stuff relative to the economy. It's the interwar period that's different. It was a dip. The econ world economy became less globalized between the two wars, became more regional blocks and protectionist and so on. But by now it's about back to where it was in 1913, you know, relative to the size of the economy. I mean, there are changes, but, you know, that's mostly like that. Uh, furthermore, the internationalization, you know, the globalization is within what's called the triad, three rich industrial areas, United States, Western Europe, and Japan. About 75% of everything is within those three areas. 
Uh, if you look at uh, uh, one important way of attacking markets is what are called strategic alliances. So like, you know, general, the three big computer manufacturers, IBM, uh, Toshiba, and Siemens, they don't want to have to compete with each other, you know, make more profit if you work together and have a monopoly. So they form what's called a strategic alliance. They all work together. So like they're developing new, you know, semiconductors and all kind of stuff together. Those strategic alliances are uh, about 90% of them are within the triad. And if you look at high technology, it's 100%. <coughs> okay, that means all of this stuff is going on within three areas where you've got parliamentary institutions. You know, you can pass laws. Uh, there's no, not going to be any military coups. So even without any institutional change at all, you know, forget radicalism, without any institutional at all, institutional change at all, it's completely within uh, the control of, uh, you know, uh, under the control of simple parliamentary institutions just that exist right now. Uh, the talk about it's being kind of out of control and, you know, the miracles of the market and all this kind of stuff, that's mostly fraud. Not totally, but mostly fraud. And think of the effect that it has. And I think you can see why it's going on. The effect that it has is, make, is to make people feel hopeless. I know if it's all laws, you know, like Newton's laws or something, uh, and uh, nothing you can do about it, we're victims of market processes and so on, well, the idea is you give up. What can we do? You know? uh, so it makes people feel hopeless and apathetic and so on. On the other hand, if you look at it closely, there's no reason whatsoever to think that it's out of control, even without any institutional change. Okay, so even, on, I mean, by, on very conservative assumptions, namely keep everything in place, it's controllable. And then the question comes up, why keep everything in place? You know, I mean, take, say, corporations, where, where'd they come from? Oh, they're pretty recent inventions. I mean, any classical liberal would scream his head off at the idea of a corporation. Corporations are, were created early in this century in their present form to attack market principles. That was their purpose. You know, they were the design to internalize risk and to uh, attack the natural rights doctrine, classical liberal, do classical liberal doctrine is that rights inhere in human beings, <coughs> like an individual has rights, not super individual organic entities. They don't have any rights, okay? Uh, but this attacked that. It's, in fact, the roots are rather like uh, Bolshevism and fascism. Uh, organic entities, which are over and above individuals, have rights. It's a major attack on the whole classical liberal tradition, you know. And in fact, conservative, uh, you know, legal theorists and those guys were very much opposed to the judicial decisions. There were never any laws. The judicial decisions that granted corporations extra, pers you know, personal powers, like the right to free speech, say. I mean, in the 19th century, corporations didn't have the right to free speech. Free speech means advertising, okay? The idea that corporations have a right to advertise would have been denounced by any classical liberal. I mean, they're not people. They don't have any rights, you know? Maybe the members of them have rights, like if it's kind of like a partnership. So the individuals have rights, but not the corporation. Or the right to, say, buy some other property. Where'd that come from? Or protection from search and seizure, like you can't go in and get their records. I mean, that's an individual right. It's not a corporate right. Well, you know, corporations early in this century were granted huge rights, not by legislation, by courts mainly, lawyers, you know, intellectuals, including progressive intellectuals, uh, who kind of changed the culture around. But that's recent, thin, you know, no reason why it should exist. Uh, there's good basis for just dismantling the whole apparatus uh, and uh, putting them under democratic control. Well, that's institutional change. And, you know, that could, gets rid of the whole system. Uh, but, and it's, it's, again, very conservative. You know, that's going back to principles that were just standard in the 19th century. In fact, if you look further, uh, right through the 19th century in the United States, through the mid-19th, well, late 19th century, uh, mainstream thought was opposed to wage labor. <coughs> I mean, like Abraham Lincoln, I'm not talking just about the labor movement, but Abraham Lincoln was opposed <coughs> to wage labor. The Republican Party was the party of free labor after the Civil War still. Free labor means not wage labor, okay? Wage labor was considered an abomination. You know, the idea that you should be, rent yourself to somebody and be paid, that was considered like slavery. Uh, the North fought the Civil War under the banner of free labor, meaning no slaves, no, no wage labor. 
these are not exotic ideas. You know. uh, well, they can quickly become mainstream again. Uh, it's uh, again a matter of, uh, you know, a matter of such a, you know things people can do. I mean, these ideas are not from outer space. They happen to be right in the core of American history. Actually, the New York Times in 1970 denounced wage labor as like chattel slavery. You know, it's the New York Times. Well, not a radical rag, it's not Z Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're saying because um, so much of this is controlled by this, this triad, and this triad has no kind of system to play, that it is possible for us to make. Yeah, we're in control of the triad. Right, but, but then when it comes to GATT and, and also the multilateral agreement, agreement. How, how does that play into it? Because we, we don't have any control of that. Well, we do. We can block, first of all, we can get out of GATT, we can dismantle GATT. By legislation, uh, and we can block the multilateral agreement on investment. That's treaty. It means it has to pass Congress with a two-thirds vote. In fact, but you were stating before that it's really difficult for most countries to get out of the treaty. It's difficult for Mexico, but nothing is difficult for the United States because it does what it feels like. Uh, if the three major powers, you know, Japan, Western Europe, and the United States, if they decide, let's say through legislation, with no institutional change, they decide they pass legislation which says, okay, we, uh, uh, we dismantle the GATT treaty, everybody else follows. I mean, if Mexico says, I want to get out of GATT, they get smashed, you know. Then all the markets of the world get closed to them, they're dead. But you can't close the markets of the world to, uh, like if Nicaragua, like take, say, Nicaragua. Nicaragua won a, court, a world court suit against the United States. The, wor the, United, the world court uh, uh, ordered the United States not only to terminate the war, but also to pay billions of dollars of reparations. Okay? So the United States was ordered to pay about $17 billion of reparations to Nicaragua. Well, you know, here everybody laughs. Uh, Nicaragua has a way of enforcing that. They can close their markets to the United States. Right? That's the method permitted to them under the international law. You know, big excitement here. So, you know. On the other hand, if the United States closes its markets to Nicaragua, they're finished. So the stuff that goes on in the triad happens to dominate the world. You know, I don't know exactly how much, but probably 80% of the world's wealth or something is in there. Mm. Uh, MAI, the first meeting I know of was in Boston on May 30th. I was supposed to speak at it, but I happened to be in South Africa. I don't know if any of you heard what happened. I didn't hear any reaction. But there was a kind of like a teach-in called in Boston uh, on May, th I think by Jobs with, for, with Justice or one of those groups. Nobody heard any. Yeah, I wasn't here, so I don't know what happened. But they had a pretty good bunch of people speaking, including some people who surprised me, like uh, Raymond Vernon, you know him? He's a hotshot professor at Harvard who writes on corporations and stuff. He spoke there, which I guess against it, otherwise he wouldn't have been on the program, which is uh, interesting. Uh, but I don't know what happened. I never heard. I was away. I, I think that was the first reaction. Um, there is a group in Washington, a little research institute called Preamble. I forget what it stands for. But it's a, like a very good, re, you know, kind of research group in Washington. They've been publicizing material about that. Actually, they're the ones who've leaked the text. I got the text from them. I don't know how they got it. Uh, but, uh, I mean, technically it's public. Like, you can, you know, you can write to your congressional representative and demand to see it because they have access to it. Uh, you know, they may say they don't, never heard of it or something, but you know, they have. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it has to be made. It, it, a little bit about it appeared in the, some of it is leaked into the left press. Like there was a piece in the multinational monitor. And actually the preamble guys had a, uh, uh, an item in the nation around January. So a little, you know, it's sort of leaking around. Actually you ought to get somebody to write about it for Z. Uh, in fact, I'd, if I'd suggest you might go to the preamble people directly. They're the ones who are right at the center. Uh, but uh, people should know about it. It's an um, it's a astonishing treaty. You just can't believe it. You know. 
And what about APEC? Well, APEC is, you know, the United States is only marginally part of it. Uh, I mean, that's really a, you know, that's the Japan controlled area. Uh, I mean, the U.S. is there, you know, anything, anything. The United States is always a big player because it's so powerful, but it doesn't really run APEC. Uh, and APEC will do what it wants, I think. They're strong enough at this point to proceed. I mean, there's two big centers of power there. There's Japan. Uh, which is huge, you know. I mean, and like, its, cap its reserves are probably bigger than any other country. That's the biggest manufacturing country in the world. It's not small. Uh, and there's also overseas Chinese capital, which nobody knows how to measure, but it's a huge thing. And those two centers of power are sort of the core of APEC. The United States is part of it, because you can't leave the United States out. But uh, they, they seem to be moving pretty slowly. Uh, they don't want anything like the Western-style uh, trade agreement. So it's not, not a <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, it's sinister. Like, Japan is not a nice place. You know, Singapore is not a nice place. But they're not nice in other ways, <laughs> not this way, you know. I mean, for example, all of these, every one of these countries is committed to, uh, in none of these countries accept this kind of neoliberal model that the West has tried to impose on the third world. Actually, the United States, the rich countries don't accept it either for themselves. But they don't, they're not the richest countries and they don't accept it. That's why they've developed. And they're moving in their own direction, whatever it'll be. You know. Actually, it's not too clear what it'll be. There's a lot of problems there when you look closely. Like, say, say South Korea. Uh, South Korea has become a major industrial power it's under a lot of pressure to liberalize, what's called liberalize. And a lot, a lot of the, ins that's coming from rich sectors inside Korea too, you know, because they'd like to be a part of the bigger story. But there's a good possibility if they go in that direction, they'll go back to the third world. Quite possible. I mean, their progress has come from, you know, state coordination, capital controls, uh, all sorts of other things. If they give that up, they may just, you know, become a assembly plant for Japan. You mentioned the World Court. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, they ruled that uh, nuclear weapons are illegal. And they didn't quite. They were under it. It's, it's amazing what they did do. But they were under tremendous pressure from the you know, United States, other rich countries, not to rule it illegal. And they didn't quite say that. They made a qualified statement saying that, uh, which, uh, you know, didn't exclude the use of nuclear weapons in what they called, you know, dire circumstances or something. Yeah. Um, there's recently been some action in, in the U.S. where um, that decision hasn't even been able to use the World Court. I'm just wondering um, how that's going to affect um, other international players. Is, is that well, you know, I mean, the World Court or any of these things, it's kind of like human, you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights or international law. I mean, these are weapons against the weak. The powerful do what they feel like. So, I mean, the clearest case was the World Court decision against the United States. In the case of Nicaragua, the World Court ordered the United States to terminate the unlawful use of force, means international terrorism against Nicaragua, and to pay reparations. Congress, which was controlled by Democrats, responded at once by increasing aid to the Contras by $100 million. Okay, that was the immediate reaction. Uh, actually, I reviewed this, I think, in Z or somewhere. Uh, across the board, everyone attacked the World Court. The World Court had discredited itself by coming out with a decision against the United States. Uh, that, I mean, Bob Lake, and some of you may know, he's interesting character, kind of Maoist lunatic, who became a big, they needed him because the whole, the le this is an interesting story about the media. Typically the media, you know, they, if they want to, if you want a, some position to be expressed supportive of power, you go to the local university and the proper academic department and somebody will come out and say exactly, you know, what you want to say and then you put it in their words, not your words. It didn't work in Central America. During the Central American Wars, 
It didn't work. For some reason, the Latin American Studies Association, the professional association, refused to go along with the whole business. So they were wiped out of the media. If you take a look through the 80s, nobody ever goes to the Latin American Studies Association for an opinion on anything. Uh, they, and what they had to do was invent a new cadre of experts. You know, they had to dredge people up from somewhere so they could be the experts. And one of the guys they got was this Bob Lakin, who we know from MIT, who's uh, an old progressive labor Maoist, uh, who was off in Mexico with talking nonsense about the revolution. Uh, but he realized that, you know, that, that, that Maoism and Reaganism are very similar. Uh, they, they, and, and he start, and, and the Carnegie Foundation and the New York Review also realized it. So he quickly be, he became a, you know, senior fellow of the Carnegie Foundation, and he was testifying before Congress and writing long articles in the New York Review and a book and so on. And you have to understand this literature to see what he was doing. But his, he was t writing about how the primary contradiction is between you know the people and the hegemonists. I mean, if you've been through all of this bullshit, you understand what this means. You know, it means the big enemy is the Russians. You know, and the sturdy peasants, uh, you know, namely the Contras, are fighting against hegemonism and you know blah blah blah. I mean, all this Maoist, you know, baby talk was coming out. It was all being published in the most respectable places, uh, and it fit exactly with the uh, picture that was needed. So Bob Lake, and getting back to the World Court, uh, after. Uh, um, you know, after the World Court decision, he would, you have to go to the expert. So he was approached by the Washington po or New York Times, I guess, and he said, well, this just shows how the World Court is an instrument of the Soviet Union. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, the Russian judge on the World Court had withdrawn from the case, you know. I mean, even if he, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You know, any kind of lunacy is okay, you know, as long as it comes out the right way. That was the reaction of the World Court. Uh, even, you know, guys who, uh, you know, big exponents of international law like Thomas Frank and so on said, no, not this time. World Court is really out of line. You don't criticize the United States. And the thing disappeared. In fact, the judgment of the World Court was never even reported here. I mean, aside from places like Z, you know, like the words that I, I quoted, unlawful use of force. I don't think that appeared anywhere outside of maybe things I wrote or a couple of other, a couple of international lawyers mentioned it. Uh, furthermore, the, an, a crucial decision of the world, you know, uh, remember, on, if you recall, the aid to the Contras was always called humanitarian aid. Right to the end, in 1990, always humanitarian aid. I mean, nobody ever deviated from that. The World Court specifically addressed that question. You take a look at the World Court decision in 1986. It's a, it concludes, you know, a long legal argument. None of the aid, no matter what it is, you know, band-aids, going to the uh, Contras is humanitarian aid. It is all military aid. And then they give a long analysis. Zero effect. You know? I mean, nobody ever referred to it. You know, we call it humanitarian aid. It's humanitarian aid. World Court can you know, drop dead. Uh, that's international law. Uh, there's going to be a, we're going to be a barrage next year about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Might as well get prepared for it. It's the 50th anniversary. It's going to be December 98. So there's going to be a huge business about how the United States courageously stands up for the universality of the Universal Declaration against third world relativists, you know, who try to say that only some of it applies and so on and so forth. It's worth reading the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The United States is in the lead in violating it in principle. And in the official position of the United States, official, is that the, half the Universal Declaration has no standing. That's why? Because it calls for socioeconomic rights, like the right to food and health and a decent job and so on and so forth. That's the same status as anything else. But the United States is against it, so it has no standing. And the U.S. being against it doesn't make us relativists, you know. <laughs> because, you know, after all, it's the U.S. that decides what happens. We, we got the guns. Uh, and wait and see how many, uh, you know, uh, human rights uh, specialists, uh, you know, advocates make a fuss about this. Interestingly, even Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which are very good groups, they do good things, but if you look at their, the way they frame human rights, it's pretty much the U.S. agenda. So it's what's called anti-torture rights, not the right to food. Like Amnesty International doesn't 
accuse governments, like say the US government, of um, failure to meet human rights standards because there's 30 million people hungry. Okay. It does. That's a violation of the Universal Declaration. You know. But it's not within the domain of Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch because the framework is Western control. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> for example?